Okay, so welcome again. And maybe if you could each just uh, introduce yourselves, tell us your name, maybe your latest book, and what you've been doing the last uh, 20 or 30 years, just to give everyone an idea, and then I'll move into questions. Uh, so we could go in order. Uh, we can go Dr. Clapper, Dr. McDougall, and Dr. Espinosa. Uh, hi, everyone. Hello, Steve. Uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, as you've heard, I'm Dr. Michael Clapper. I've been a practicing physician for 50, count them, 50 years now, uh, and as well as practicing uh, preventive plant-based medicine. Uh, I'm also working to educate medical students and young physicians to uh, the important fact that what their patients are eating has something to do with all these diseases that we're being asked to treat. Uh, and so as part of our Moving Medicine Forward initiative where I go to the medical schools and I give lectures to the medical students that I wish someone had given me 50 years ago. So um, that's uh, taking up the majority of my time as, long, as well as riding bicycles and enjoying this beautiful world. Dr. McDougall. Yeah, I, thank you very much. Um, I've been right next to Dr. Clapper all along the way for the last 50 years. We've been side by side in this battle. Uh, right now, I'm running a 12-day uh, telemedicine program where we take people from pretty much all over the world, and we offer them education, medical care, and support in a way we've never been able to do before. I've run a hospital-based program, did that for 16 years, ran a resort-based program for 22 years, and thanks to COVID, we have gone online. And the nice thing is, is that uh, all the work we've done in the past, it doesn't even compare what we've been able to do with people through the internet. You know, now we're able to go in their homes, uh, teach them how to cook, hear about their blood pressure, their blood sugar, how they're doing. You know, we're, we're right there, side by side. It's a much more intimate program than we've ever run before. And uh, so it, I'm getting a lot of pleasure out of that. But I'll tell you, I've I focused on another thing that uh, is taken pretty much all of my attention, and that is that uh, I have a new patient, and that new patient is planet Earth. You know, I'm trying to to practice diet therapy for planet Earth, and you know, I, I just put ten studies up on our new website, which is McDougallFoundation.org. Ten studies that show you can reduce your global warming gases, your greenhouse gas contribution by somewhere around 80% overnight by changing to the kind of diet that Dr. Clapper and I have been recommending for 50 years. So, you know, I, I, I've been trying to figure out ways to get people to notice to do something because what's happening is we're losing our home and we have an option. Everybody's talking about how terrible things are. Yeah, they're terrible, but let's start talking about what we can do to get out of trouble. And that's the effort that I've been making these days, trying to provide a very optimistic, let's go get them, let's not stop fighting. We got a world to save. And so that's what I've been up to. Thank you. I guess it's my turn. Um, I, I have not been practicing for 50 years, 50. Um, but when I started this journey on natural medicine, one of the first books that I read were Dr. Kapler's book and Dr. McDougal, uh, McDougal's books. Um, so it is uh, an extreme honor to be on the same panel. I've been practicing for about 20 years, <laughs> uh, which seems like it's nothing. Sometimes I feel like that. Wow, that's a long time. And I, when I'm listening to you guys, I'm saying, wow, <laughs> I'm just a baby. <laughs> just starting out here. Um, Last, uh, so the, the, the newest and last thing, the things that I've been, so what I decided to do when I started an, this journey of natural medicine and diet as medicine, nutrition as medicine and so forth. Um, of course, I went to medical, uh, naturopathic medical school and then I, you know, you're trained to be a naturopathic doctor and see everything, of course. And if you don't know what the patient has then just treat the gut and they'll do better kind of thing, right? I didn't feel comfortable with that. I felt that uh, either there's more to it than that, or I'm just probably not as smart as my colleagues who knew about every condition and the pathophysiology of those conditions and the pharmaceuticals for those conditions. And then I was overwhelmed. So I decided to, uh, to take the road less traveled 
and um, go into a specialty in urology. So for the last 20 some odd years, I've been uh, working at uh, NYU as I'm a faculty member there uh, as a faculty in uh, integrative and functional urology. So in essence, of course, I just pretty much see about six conditions, uh, all urological, uh, and a big part of that is prostate cancer. And um, if there's a, a, a pregnant female that calls my office to see me, I have to turn them away because I haven't done that kind of work in a while. Um, so I'm very happy with the work that I do. It's very narrow and focused in one area. Of course, you treat the whole person. Of course, I never have a walking prostate come into my office. There's always a person with a prostate that comes into my office. So those are always the principles that we use and trying to address the cause and so forth. Um, so that's what I've been doing. And as of late, um, the Dr. Geo podcast is out. Uh, as of today, there's eight episodes there. Um, uh, I invite everyone who's really interested and serious about um, men's health and different approaches to uh, sign up to that. And then my blog, which is drgeo.com, drgeo.com. I, um, uh, I spend most of my time researching, writing, seeing patients, uh, time with my family and writing and, 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 and doing research. So I think uh, most people that are interested in that approach uh, will, would find that interesting. Um, uh, and lastly, actually, there is one more thing. <laughs> um, I'm doing a master course in integrative and functional urology. So it's the, Inter uh, it's the in uh, Integrative and Functional Urology, urology Institute, which will embark this summer for pr healthcare practitioners who um, are interested in really knowing what to do with people with urological conditions, but certainly with men. I find that most practitioners are confused and not doing a good job as clinicians in men's health. So I try to provide some of my expertise and knowledge and research in that area. And that's about it, Steve. Thanks so much for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I, I will not let my mother know about this. She, she would be proud, but because it's Good Friday and I'm supposed to be a really good Catholic, uh, I shouldn't be working on Good Friday. So I'll make sure that she has no idea <laughs> that I'm doing this uh, tonight. <laughs> okay, thank you. Right, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, this is John, the uh, tech guy. Uh, Dr. McDougal, I think we're getting some feedback from your mic when you speak. Can you, can you try testing it out one more time? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. It uh, sounds, sounds good. Okay. Okay. So what I'd like to... Feedback? I'm sorry, say that again? I say, are you hearing feedback? No, not, not currently. Okay. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I would like to ask you a number of questions. Um, uh, for each question, I guess we can go in order, Dr. McDougall, Dr. Clapper, and Dr. Geo. We have allotted three minutes per question. That means one minute each. If one of you don't want to answer it or it doesn't pertain, just say pass, and then someone else can use that minute. So if the first two of you do not say anything, then Dr. Geo, you could spend up to three minutes on the question. Otherwise, a strict one minute per question per person so that we can go through all of these important topics. So I realize that on each question, we could spend 90 minutes and you could each go on for the entire time. Um, for now, we're just gonna have to get the quick answer and not the detailed answer uh, so that we can cover a lot more material. Okay, so let's get started and say pass if it's not a question that you feel pertains to your area of expertise. Okay. So this is day 16 of 17 of the Real Truth About Health Conference. <clears throat> and you know, to get a really good conference, you need great, great speakers. So to get great speakers, I invite the best speakers in the world. And I don't wanna bring them he here and then um, harass them with you know, questions. I want them to like me and feel good about it. But at the same time, I don't want to, to be nice, not ask them, about the differences between what they're saying and other people are saying. So while I wanna be supportive of all 75 speakers, it is, it, it's not fair for the audience if I don't address the fact that really smart, credentialed, confident speakers are saying things different than other confident, credentialed, smart speakers. So I'm gonna point this out. I'm not trying to harass anyone. I just wanna try to make sure we all get the best information. Okay, so the first question is, 
Many of the speakers, almost all of them, said that a whole food plant-based diet um, is good. And many of them said we should avoid plant fats. That your nuts, seeds, olives, avocados is, is something to minimize or avoid. Almost all of them said to avoid oils. A few of them said not only, so three categories. One that said avoid fats, nuts, seeds, uh, plant fats, nuts, seeds, avocados, and olives. A second group said, those are okay to eat, but avoid the oils. And then a third group said, no, it's okay to have the nuts, the seeds, the olives, the avocados, and also the oils. And um, they said that, you know, there's concern that some, some long-term vegans have dementia because they didn't have enough oil. So that's it, the three categories, no fats at all, fats, but no oils, or fats and oils. Um, if you guys could offer your feedback on that starting with uh, Dr. McDougall and Dr. Clapper, then Dr. Espinosa. Well, fats as nature intended them when they're in the foods are fine. Uh, I, I don't think nuts, seeds and avocados are unhealthy, but they're very dense in calories and fat. If you're trying to lose weight, they're not foods that you wanna keep in your diet. Otherwise, if you're trim, active, don't have any particular problems, I, I don't see an issue. A uh, free oil does not occur in nature. Uh, it's at best a medicine. At worst, it's a toxin. So I don't think anybody should be using olive oil, canola oil, you know, safflower oil, any of these free oils. I absolutely agree with uh, everything Dr. McDougall said. Fats are not evil. We need them. Our skin oils are made of fats. Our hormones are made of fats. You need some fats, but get them out of whole foods, uh, avocados and nuts, uh, seeds, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm not a big fan of oils. Why? Because when you eat an olive, when you eat a walnut, um, the micro droplets of walnut oil, uh, olive oil, whatever, coconut oil, um, it takes hours for the digestive enzymes to get into that piece of coconut or olive and uh, to, uh, for the amylase enzymes to break up the starches and the lipase enzymes to emulsify the fats. And as a result, uh, the very small amount of fat goes up very minimally in the blood. One pass through the liver, it's gone. But you pour two, uh, half a cup of olive oil on your pasta, ooh, Mediterranean diet, ooh, heart healthy, more oil is better. You do that and nothing slows down the absorption. That fat leaps into your bloodstream. Now you add a couple of tablespoons of liquid oil in your blood and it starts exerting pharmaceutical effects, saturates into the walls of the arteries and paralyzes their ability to dilate. Uh, it works its way into liver and muscle cells, increasing insulin resistance, interferes with blood clotting. These oils have pharmaceutical effects that the, that the fats in the natural food state do not. And that's our, our problem with the oils there. So eat fats, yay, but get it out of the uh, packages that nature gave us, uh, gave them to us in. I guess it's my turn. Yep, all yours. Um, so um, again, my perspective is all, always from the perspective of men's health and the things that are important for urological function. And I, I do understand there's way more to that, including brain function and cardiovascular, of course. And the number one killer in the world is cardiovascular disease. So I'm never lose, losing sight of those things. What I would say is this, I've, I've, done, um, I've done every diet myself under the book, including raw food vegan to then Atkins and everything else in between experimentally and so forth. Um, and I've done uh, as much research as I possibly can on the topic. What I would say is that um, fats are essential, like any other macronutrient. I think the number one problem in the world dietarily is not so much fat, is the overconsumption of foods, period, overconsumption of energy. Um, so, so that being the case, um, all these macronutrients are indeed important. And I think that one of the reasons that people are overeating is because um, they're eating too much crap, obviously. Um, and but the, the good fats promote satiety, and I think and I think that helps quite a bit. Again, I've experimented myself quite a, quite a few times. So I think fats are essential. Then, as it relates to which fats, I think that the problem is not fats themselves. I think the problems are rancid fats and or trans, fat, uh, trans fats uh, the, the, from fried foods and so forth. I think fried foods are like a fried potato chip or fried uh, French fries are probably one of the worst foods that uh, I think it's under overlooked. 
um, because you have empty starch uh, from that potato, plus you have uh, the rancid oils that is exposed to. So I do think fats are essential. I think fats are important. Uh, um, and uh, I think that, um, again, the, the problem is overconsumption of fats, proteins, and just food in general, I think is one of the major problems where that's facing most of the uh, health problems that we're facing nowadays. I can't, we can't hear you. You're muted, Steve. Thank you, sorry. Um, I want to point out to the audience that all three speakers speak for themselves unless they say that they have the same opinion as another. You should assume that each peer person has done their own research, had their own experience, and what one person says is what they are saying. It might or might not be representative of what the others feel. So uh, just assume that each speaker is speaking for themselves. Um, okay. Um, during the course of this conference, um, there was a lot of positivity about whole food plant-based diets. So the question I'd like to ask is, you know, do people following an ideal diet and lifestyle still get cancer, dementia, strokes, heart disease, and diabetes? Um, you know, Dr. Esselstein uses the term heart attack proof. I love it. But I just want to know what the reality is because I'm a little bit on a high that like I'm following this great whole food plant-based diet, but you know, I'm not watching people in their 70s and 80s and 90s who've been doing this for 50 years. So you probably have. Do people who follow this ideal diet and lifestyle still get cancer, dementia, strokes, heart disease, and diabetes? Starting with Dr. McDougall, then Dr. Clapper, then Dr. Espinosa. The answer is no. And if you look, uh, the way you figure this out is you look back at traditional diets and traditional people, like for example, the Japanese before World War II, <clears throat> they had virtually no heart disease, no prostate cancer, no breast cancer. And you can find other populations like that. And they of course had many people who lived past 90 and they were free of these diseases. So that's the only place you can get that kind of information from is look at other populations, look at their history, see what they ate. And you see people who have lived on starch-based diets, which I call traditional diets. They fare extremely well. In other words, you say, does nothing ever happen? Well, you know, probably one, it happened once in a while, but it, not to any great degree. Um, I'm reminded of the Woody Allen movie, I think Sleeper, uh, where he, uh, the figure goes to sleep, wakes up a uh, hundred years later and asks about his friends. And he says, oh, John, oh, he died. And Woody Allen's amazed. He couldn't have died. He ate brown rice. And um, it's like, you know, if we eat these foods, we're magically we're going to live forever. Um, nobody gets out of here alive. The mortality rate in, in this conference is 100%. And that's the way it needs to be. Um, the question is how healthy you're going to be through whatever years you're given on this planet. And what we were to, to really answer that question, you would need to start with, with little babies being raised as, as whole food, plant-based vegan by their parents uh, and go all the way through their lives or 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and see what really happens to them. And we really should do that study, by the way, what does happen to these people? Uh, it's really, really important. But most of us, we came to plant-based diets in our 30s and 40s and 50s. And by then, who knows what diseases were already starting uh, incipiently in, in, in our tissues there. And then when, I, when a cancer jumps out in a fellow who has been on a plant-based diet for a few years, but, oh, what happened? Well, that cancer may have started you know, decades ago. And, and plus there's environmental issues where we're breathing in toxins and there's carcinogens in the drinking water. It's not a pristine world we're living in, the food's adulterated. So for us to say, oh, whole food plant-based, that's our guarantee. You do the best you can with the genes and body that we've been given. Uh, so much has to do with your emotions and your positive outlook, uh, far more than uh, the, the calories on your plate there. Uh, and, and again, the best thing you can do is do the best you can do. Raise your children on, <clears throat> excuse me, on a healthy plant-based diet. If you do, they should never develop obesity, diabetes, hypertension, clogged arteries. It should not happen. The, the gorillas in, in, uh, out in nature, they don't develop clogged arteries. Why should they? They're eating leaves and fruits all day. 
and uh, and that should that physiology should apply generally to us. But again, uh, we eat out in restaurants. We uh, we're under stress. We watch TV, uh, and it's a it's not a, a health proof life here or disease proof life. So you do the best you can, and and every plant based meal you have makes the planet more healthy and uh, makes it a better future for everyone who comes after us. I think that's even more important. So uh, do the best you can, eat, eat a lot of plants, don't eat any animals. So I'm reminded, so when I started doing this 25 years ago or so, I, I had no, I was going into reg just regular medical school and then, but I didn't know much about natural foods or tofu or anything. So I, I decided to work in health food stores. Back then there were not a lot of whole foods. So there were the uh, dingy old uh, health food store that's dusty with the black cat on top of the counter. And I, I worked in a few of those um, and I decided to learn about foods and so forth. One of my takeaways there was, and I already started becoming a believer in nutrition and food as medicine. And I still am, of course. Um, but one of my takeaways was that um, a lot of the people that were coming in with their carts full of organic foods were very unhealthy. I also worked in a regular Italian restaurant, um, and I used to see that some people were actually pretty healthy uh, that came into the restaurant and ordered things in the right portions. They, uh, they split the portion, they never eat a full portion for themselves, despite whatever it was, pasta, let's just say pasta and sauce or whatever. Uh, they had a salad and things like that. And again, people in the health food store that were coming in, they were pretty unhealthy. So I, I that, you know, that kind of intrigued me. And I became curious, like, what's happening? I will, obviously, I don't know, it's an oversimplification. But what I would say is this, um, uh, there, as Dr. Kapler mentions, um, there, there's just more to it than that. Um, I, I see in my world, I see vegans that are coming in with advanced prostate cancer all the time, actually. I see vegans and raw foodists that I know that I'm not sure what people think about raw food, but that are coming in with serious pelvic dysfunction and prostatitis and interstitial cystitis. Uh, and those are the associations that, that I've made. So it's not a, a, and then when you look at blue zones, they're not all, it's more than just their diet. It's community actually quite a bit there too, when you look at blue zones. Um, and some of them do incorporate some level of fish and even a little bit of meat in their diet. I think it's an over, oversimplification to uh, try to prevent disease only through a vegan diet. Um, I do think, and my definition of plant-based, and I know it's not a common as well, which is primarily plant foods, but the inclusion of perhaps, um, you know, some fish and salmon. I'm, I think I'm a big fan of salmon as a fish. I think it has a lot of nutritional value. Um, and I'm Cuban. So when I go to my mother's house, she's not going to allow me not to have whatever she's cooking. And it's not the healthiest thing. So rather than being so dogmatic uh, about that, I think it, we, it behooves us to say, okay, what's the better approach 80-20 rule? And then what else is important? I think community is important. I think relationships are very important for health. Um, I, exercise is, if you put a gun in my head, and I know that's a tough one, what's most important, exercise or, or, or diet? It's like asking me which one of my three kids I love the most. Uh, I don't know. I think I love them all. But no, what's the most important? I think exercise is really important. Um, and it, as I mentioned earlier, too much energy consumption is the big uh, problem. So what I would say is that, um, yeah, diets are cognition and Alzheimer's. High starch diet and probably high bad starch or simple starches are associated with things like Alzheimer's and poor cognition as as people age. Of course, oversimplification when you look at these studies is there's a lot of there's a lot of variables. I think you have to look at it holistically and put a program together for people that are doable and so that they eat without guilt. I think that's very important as well. Um, but overall I, I just think there's more to it than just honestly than a vegan diet to prevent cognition and all these diseases, uh, cognitive problems, cancer, heart disease. You're muted, Dr. McDougall. I just wondered if I could have a couple more sure. seconds. Yes, time. take your time. Take your time. You know, if, if you only, to answer your question, the only way I know to answer it is to look back at populations of people. Like, for example, uh, lupus was first described in Africa in 1960. Before 1957, there was no rheumatoid arthritis. Before 1980, Type 2 diabetes virtually didn't exist in China, nor did obesity. I know, and Dr. Esselstyn knows also, that prostate cancer didn't exist in Japan before World War II. 
So, you know, you're talking about millions of people who lived on starch-based diets, not, not necessarily vegan diets, but diets based on rice, corn, potatoes, beans, who avoided all the diseases you're talking about. Heart disease in this country was only described 150 years ago. These are diseases over overnutrition of eating a rich diet, and they never occurred. Multiple sclerosis didn't occur in China before 1980. I mean, I know these things from my study of history. So, if you know, to answer your question, Steve, which is a, a really important one, is there a possibility? Is there a place to go? Yeah, you have to look back at where you people used to eat. And these people I want to point out, some exercised, many didn't. All of them had stress in their life. They had divorces, they had fights, they had children who went wrong. I mean, these, these kinds of things have been around forever, but it's the food that changed, particularly in the last 50 years. So, you know, I, I can pretty much assure you that these diseases can be avoided. Infectious disease is a whole different thing. You know, they had those problems back then lack of medical care, they had those problems back then, but they didn't die of dietary diseases ever. If I may, as it relates, 30 seconds, quick, as it relates to prostate cancer, um, it's, it's interification to why, um, as to why uh, Asians uh, have lower risk and then when they move to the US, they have higher risk. Certainly it's dietary, that's one component. Um, environmental toxins, which, which has increased throughout the years is another, more pesticides and so forth. But to, 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 you know, they also, they also smoke a whole lot more than we do. So is it, you know, is smoking what, one of the reasons how, why they're protected from prostate cancer? So it's, I think that dietarily is an oversimplification. There are clues for sure. Um, again, with soy, um, I think soy is fine, but I don't think it's a cure. Some people drink soy or eat a lot of soy for as cure for prostate. There is no one food as a cure. And to, and the other thing, Asians make, um, uh, uh, a chemical from soy that the rest of uh, the rest of us don't. When they consume soy, some of the chemicals are converted to enol, and enol seems to be protective against prostate cancer. But the rest of us don't have the enzymes to convert uh, diacinine and and some other chemicals in soy to enol. So there is a genetic component uh, as well that we cannot undermine. Of course, uh, epigenetics is a bigger factor where. You turn off the gene or turn or turn on the cancer gene, but I don't. I, uh, in terms of uh, comparing populations, that as it relates to prostate cancer, which is what I know most, um, it's not um, it's not apples to apples. I don't think. Okay. Um, so uh, the next question is regarding fish, and uh, Dr. Espinosa, I realize that in the real world you're in a very difficult situation that you're not speaking to vegan conferences, you're speaking to the general public and to get them to make any changes is a big deal. And so your approach um, to be not hyper extreme probably is very beneficial because then you're gonna get very little compliance if you try to be extreme. However, for the purposes of just a person who's trying to be optimal diet to lowest possibility of getting any health issue, um, where what are your thoughts on uh, eat it. What are all three of your thoughts on eating fish? Shall I start? Please. You better eat them quick because 90% of them are gone. I can tell how much fish you eat based on your methylmercury content in your body. Fish, they're, they're protein, their cholesterol, their fat. They have no fiber. They have no carbohydrate. You know, there's not much difference between a muscle that moves a limb versus a muscle that flaps a wing versus a muscle that wiggles a tail. They're all the same. And this idea that fish is health food, not only is harmful for people, what it's done to the planet is horrible. So get this nonsense out of your world, please. Fish are toxic. And you know, the reason that I think that they found that people eat fish are healthier is because that was, that was the, the norm then, people believed that. And so you found people who were better read, more concerned about their health, giving up beef, for example, and switching to other muscles, fish, for example. But that, that's the only reason we have that particular, oh, there's a couple other nonsense things out there like omega-3 fats and so on, that, that they're sold 
an idea that's wiping out our oceans. It's got to stop. Hard to add much more to that. He's, he, he hit all the notes uh, in that song. Absolutely. I think that when you look at a piece of salmon on your plate, you got to ask what's in there. What's the mercury content, the dioxin content, pesticides, etc. But beyond that, as John says, we are clear cutting the ocean. We, we're strip mining the ocean with these 10 mile wide nets that scoop up every living creature for every piece of wild caught salmon on your plate. There's dozens of seabirds and dolphins and turtles and rays and sharks and whales that have been caught in those nets uh, and, and killed off as by kill. Um, as he's saying, it's got to stop. We've no matter what role fishing played in human history in the past, hear this, we've used fishing up. We've used it up. The oceans are emptying out enough already. It's time to let the oceans heal. Let the fish off the hook already. Uh, uh, that's, you know, we used to do a lot of things. Uh, but in the 1850s in Bedford, Massachusetts, the, the rock star folk guys on the wharf were the harpooners and the whalers. And boy, we used to go out and sh sh ram those harpoons into the whale's heads. Yay, my God. We look at that today and say, I can't believe we did that. Well, eating fish, scooping up all the cod and salmon, all that has got to be another one of those things that we used to do. But please, where there's going to be nothing left but jellyfish. And if the ocean dies, we die. And so enough with the fish eating. You get your omega-3s from plants, just like every other animal does. Uh, but uh, we, we, the, the, it's, we, we've used it up. Um, there, I can't see any rationale for continuing to eat it. And plus, it's toxic, as John says. The more you eat, uh, the more toxic you get. Let, let them off the hook. Well, um, <laughs> so um, I, I guess I'm not, I, I guess I'll just focus on the uh, nutritional and health components of, of fish and not on the environmental, uh, although that plays a role, but I don't think I'm um, knowledgeable enough uh, uh, in that area. Um, uh, so I think different, so I think some fish is essential and good for you. And I think that salmon is the best type uh, out there. Um, prove it, uh, it's in the research that I, at least that I've read um, and, and at least for prostate cancer as well. The problem, uh, there's very little mercury in salmon to none, depending on what, where you get your salmon from. So yes, the problem uh, is uh, the type of salmon. So there is farm-raised salmon that has BPA in it. And that when you go to a restaurant and you try to eat healthy and you ask for salmon, spinach, and brown rice, that's a very pro-prostate cancer dish. Why? Because the spinach is highly uh, filled with pesticides if it's not organic, particularly spinach. Uh, the salmon is farm-raised, high in BPA, and the brown rice is high in cadmium which is a heavy metal that's connected to prostate cancer. Um, some brown rice is not high in cadmium. Uh, organic spinach is fine. And um, wild Alaskan salmon is the best type to eat. Um, so I do think there is benefit there. I do think there um, you can, the, the problem that I find, and, and Steve, you said it fine uh, initially, like I'm not dealing with the people that are healthy. So I have to start them off somewhere. And I think the problem I find is that oftentimes we sort of set, set them up for failure because we're asking them to do all kinds of things that I don't even think they need to do, like give up salmon, as an example, or, or some types of fish. Um, um, it, it, um, and the other problem with fish and salmon is overcooking it uh, as you release a prostate cancer. Sorry that I have to stay in my, in, in my uh, lane here. Um, um, cooking any animal be a product um, where there's uh, all this grilling and you know promotes these carcinogenic compounds, um, that in, that situation includes salmon as well. So done the right way, it could be helpful. And certainly most of the studies as it relates to prostate cancer and male health um, are positive towards the consumption of fish, primarily salmon uh, uh, as a as a nutrient for for the, for those type of conditions. So. Thanks. I think a couple of things need to be addressed. You know, one is that fish is sold for its omega-3 fats. Mm -hmm. No fish has ever made an omega-3 fat. No animal can desaturate at the carbon-3 position. It's impossible. Right. So, so anyway, um, 
you might as well go to the original source, which is the plants. And then you don't have to go through all the risk. Right. The other thing, uh, pesticides and environmental contaminants we've talked about here. The way you get loaded with pesticides and environmental contaminants is by moving up the food chain through biomagnification. So your plants have the lowest level of pesticides, any of these poisonous chemicals, any of the toxic metals, the lowest levels are in plants. And then the fish eats the plants or the cow eats the plants. And then the people eat the fish and cows. And then the end of the food chain is babies suckling off a of mother's breast. And the breast milk is toxic because of these environmental contaminants. So if you're worried about pesticides, you're worried about environmental chemicals, you better learn that the lowest concentration is on your grains and your legumes and your root vegetables. Your high concentrations are when you move up the food chain because they're fat soluble, these chemicals, and they get stuck in the animal's fat. So let's just get this in line in the proper perspective. One more thing, uh, if I can add to that. Um, I, I do think that uh, a properly done plant-based diet can be helpful for some people, except that most people, it, it takes a tremendous amount of work for many people that I see to get enough protein. There is such thing as protein deficiency and many of the plant Never. and vegans that I see, Never. maybe they're Never. not doing it. I'm absolutely. sorry, I've got to stop this. There, this there, there is. There is. I no see it all the time. Dietary proteins. You've never seen now, it. Now, maybe they're not doing it. It so is what? impossible to do. The protein needs of human beings are so low. You can, you've got to stop this. Or I'm maybe going to put a stop to it. The this protein needs are... You are not going to continue to spread misinformation to these That's companies. not misinformation at all. That's, That's actually research-based. And I, can oh, say, I have tons of research on that. And no, that no, is my clinical papers, experience as well. On this. Now, what I would say is this, Steve. It's not impossible to be have enough, get enough proteins from a plant-based diet. It's not at all. However, I, I think people, some many people just struggle to eat enough of the plant proteins that are essential and important. Um, so, I, I, but I see that people, you know, I, I do see people that are protein deficient. Again, not because I don't think they could get enough protein from their plants. Uh, but then they're, they're just struggling with doing it correctly. And the other thing is that I find a lot of vegans, again, we have to deal with the population as a whole, not our, you know, people that are like us. I don't work with people that are like me. I'm very disciplined with my diet, with exercise, with nutrient. I don't deal with people like me. That being the case, you have to start them off somewhere. Right. And since I don't think that many uh, that salmon is a, a bad food, so they include salmon in their uh, in their in their dishes uh, in their meals. Um, and the. They what I've noticed is that vegans oftentimes become starchitarians and they eat tons of not only good carbs and bad carbs. And I think that's more problematic for longevity, for heart disease and for cancer than eating some salmon so i wish we hear from michael he, maybe he can well i again i'm i'm, I'm i i think what that i'm trying to be so i don't have an axe to grind here i'm not I, I call it the diet wars ketogenic uh uh plant uh, paleo i'm not into that i'm into the evidence and what i see clinically well, let, let is it possible to for plant-based people to do it right i think so i right. think so but i just see that they're not doing it correctly and they're, they're struggling so then I modify that for them. And, and since the research does not indicate that that's the only way to go, then uh, they go on a diet that I recommend, which includes things like salmon. Okay. Do you want, to, do you want the, the, the uh, discussions to go this way, Steve? Or do you Please have a plan? It, slow it down, right. break it down one by one and go what through we need it. To do is we need to do a little history, a little geology lesson. Uh, what we did do is look at populations of people before 150 years ago. You know, you have uh, 2 billion Asians living off white rice. Hey, they almost went, won World War II and they did won the, win the Vietnamese conflict on white rice. You know, if eating a simple starch resulted in protein deficiency, why would you have such mighty war warriors? Why would you have such mighty societies? The Aztecs and the Mayans are known as the people of the corn. They lived and over 90% of their diet was corn for 1300 years. 
they, they fought battles. They competed in athletic events. They had babies. There is no such thing as protein deficiency or amino acid deficiency on any natural diet. And you know, to eat vegan is simple. All you have to understand is you need to make the bulk of your food like traditional people have, like the, the Aztecs and the Mayans, corn, or like the Incas, potatoes, or like the American Indian, the Native American. Hey, 12,000 years ago, they were living off potatoes. <laughs> the Asians living off rice. Excuse me, open your eyes, ladies and gentlemen. Don't fall into this nonsense about how you have to be super special. You got to carry around a dietetic handbook. You got to have a dietitian right with you to make sure you combine everything just perfect. Nonsense. This is why people are so sick. They listen to this garbage. Excuse me, go ahead, Michael. <laughs> Dr. Simpson, I'd be very curious. You seem to see this entity fairly frequently. What clinical signs do you see in a vegan that makes you diagnose protein deficiency? And how do you prove that in your lab? How do you, how do you clinch that diagnosis, sir? Brittle nails, uh, hair falling off when they don't, when they don't have, uh, you know, hair is not, you know, they don't, they're not bald like me. Hair is like falling off. Excuse me. <laughs> I think there's protein deficiency. Uh, Oftentimes there is, and they include more protein into their uh, diet, and, and these things resolve. Their hair that, stops falling out when they and brittle, protein. brittle nails and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if there's any labs. I don't use labs to figure out protein. I look, I look at their, you know, physiology. Um, they look, um, uh, 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 they don't, look, and, and just they don't look healthy. And when they include some meats, they look healthier, just, just objectively and uh, subjectively, that is. Uh, I agree. I see, I see unhealthy vegans from time to time. Yeah. I'm eating a lot of processed junk. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so I whole said food, that. Please, if you are eating whole plant foods, rice, beans, greens, fruits, vegetables, if you are eating 2,000 calories a day to maintain your weight, there is no way you cannot get at least 50 to 60 grams of high grade complete protein in those 22,000 calories. It's in the yeah. rice and beans and greens. I, I think I, no I think I agree. Deficiency. I think I, I think, like I said before, I may agree with that. Um, I think it's definitely possible. And I think that the population that I see. It's impossible not to, yeah. if, unless I'm they're not eating Oreos and, and cookies and colas. And many of them actually do that. Look, if then that's just bad nutrition. Uh, and right. omnivores do that just, you know, probably more. But to say that is somehow right. implying that it's inherently protein deficient is simply biochemically impossible. And, and I, I think I, I think I, I said that or insinuated that that it's possible to get all the protein you need from a plant based diet, but most people don't. And the evidence doesn't show that excluding things like salmon is a problem. So might as well include it. Uh, eating salmon is not only bad for the salmon, it's bad for people. We told you why. Too much protein, too much fat not enough fiber, no carbohydrate. You and eat the salmon with your broccoli. That's all the fiber in the broccoli or the whatever the, the uh, plants uh, that you eat, yeah, you eat it with. Into this conversation about protein. You know, one of my mentors, in fact, uh, one of the most important people in the field of diet therapy is a fellow named Walter Kempton at Duke University who uh, used the rice diet for seven decades at Duke. The rice, rice diet was made of white rice, white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. His patients were studied in metabolic wards, never found any deficiencies at all, particularly protein deficiency in these patients. You know, scientists for 150 years have known that the need of protein in the human being is so low that it shouldn't even be considered. Why is it considered? Because you have industry selling through unique positioning their products because they're high in protein. If I say meat, you say protein. If I say eggs, you say protein. Even dairy, fish, you say protein. That's just a marketing tool. And unfortunately, if I had to pick one thing, one nutrient that has caused more death and disability to people than anything else, it's the protein myth. And that's the thing that's killing planet Earth right now, folks, is the belief that you need to eat cows and pigs and chickens and fish and salmon and other nonsense to be healthy. You're killing the planet. Yeah, you've killed yourself. That's, that may be okay with you, but yeah. it's not okay with me that you kill the planet by having this kind of nonsense go on. I'm not gonna put up with it. So let's get it straight. 
Um, as people get older, they develop sarcopenia, and, and that's because they have a pro that in part that's because they have a protein deficiency as well, and they're not exercising maybe. Um, but they definitely have a they, it, older people need more protein. Again, can you get enough? So to to respond to you that there's no such thing as protein deficiency, there is, and you need all macronutrients to be healthy and live longer and better. The question is how how much. And I think I've said it several times. I do think that it's possible to get it from a plant based. I just say uh, I just see that it's very difficult for a lot of people that I see anyway. Let me ask you something, and it's probably too early in the conversation to ask, but I wonder right now, do you sell supplements? I sell supplements, yeah. Yeah, okay. I just want to make that clear to the audience. I don't sell I don't sell protein supplements. Excuse me. Well, we've heard a lot about about super nutrients so far. I just wonder if you sold supplements. I do, yeah. Thank yeah, you. I think supplements, uh, Steve, uh, we could talk about that. I think supplements are absolutely essential. Um, it doesn't replace exercise and good eating it's, and or sleep. So it's fourth on the list. But I think to live longer and optimally, you need certain supplements to live to do that. But that's a, another story for a different day. But I don't sell uh, uh, protein powders or anything. Actually, I do. Sorry, he's a plant pro. You'd be happy. He's a plant protein powder. Uh, toxic too. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Steve. And anything else you guys want to say to clarify this or do we want to move on? I think we're going to have a fun two and a half hours, Steve. Okay. Okay. Um, so the next question is, can a person be overweight and healthy if they have normal cholesterol levels and are not diabetic? Is overweight defined by high, having a, a high BMI? Excuse me. I think I'm supposed to go first. Oh, no, no. I just want to get a definition of what overweight means. Uh, is it defined by high BMI or, or is it just a visual thing or is it a weight thing? Because I, I think that matters. How about looking in the mirror? And that means what? I, that's a way of telling you if you're overweight, if you look in the mirror, you know. Not necessarily because um, uh, there are people that weigh a lot, but their body composition is excellent. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, in answer to your question, can you be overweight and uh, still be healthy? The answer is yes. But you have to get overweight on nuts and seeds and avocados and other whole plant foods. Not on the usual reason that people get overweight, which is they eat animal foods and oils. But the fat you eat is the fat you wear. That's why people are overweight. So, you know, fortunately it doesn't happen very often because nuts and seeds and avocados, you know, except for the modern supermarket in the United States and Europe, they were a rare commodity. You only had nuts coming into season for a couple of weeks of the year. And the same thing with uh, avocados. They only came into season a couple of weeks of the year, but it, you know, every day in every supermarket, they're in season. And that's the problem. And that may be why a lot of people become what I call fat vegans. Not necessarily unhealthy, but you know what? My guess is, is somebody who's overweight, who's a vegan, who's trying to save the planet, who's trying to save animals, who has great intentions, my feeling is, is if they looked healthy, they'd be a better salesman. And that's why I pleaded with people who are what, you know, I term fat vegans to, to understand why they have a personal appearance that doesn't fit in with the rest of their message. And they need to eat a starch-based diet and get those nuts and seeds and avocados and, and you know, fake foods, fake cheesecakes and so on, uh, vegan cheesecakes out of their diet. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not a big fan of obesity. If someone's got a big pot belly, there's two things making that abdomen pooch out. Um, under the skin, uh, the subcutaneous fat is, pumps out estrogen, just the largest estrogen secreting tissue in the body. Doesn't do great things for women with breast lumps or guys with big prostates and early prostate cancer. Um, so that concerns me about overweight. And inside the abdomen, the visceral fat that surrounds the intestines, this is metabolically active and it pumps out inflammatory cytokines. It pumps out interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and this fans inflammatory reactions throughout the body. And so many diseases from arthritis to cancers are, have an inflammatory component, even depression. And so obesity is a state of inflammation. And no matter how one rationalizes it, um, you, in my opinion, you can't be healthy and be obese. 
overweight, then you, you get into the BMI thing about, well, a big muscular guy might have a big BMI and he's uh, on, uh, obese on the scale and he's really not. But we're, when we're talking about honest to goodness, excess fat, someone is over fat on the body, it's a state of inflammation. And, and I just can't view that as healthy, uh, even though the person's uh, psychological state, listen, I'm fat, that's the way I am. And, and if they're not losing sleep over, God bless them, that's wonderful. But as far as the state of inflammation in their body, um, uh, I think it, it promotes disease on a lot of levels. So no, I don't think you can be over fat and, and healthy as well. Yeah, so I, I think that, um, and the reason why I ask is because when you look at population studies, they study, it, what they use is BMI, right? And uh, I see a lot of people in my office who, which BMI is high, but their body fat count is low. So what we are concerned about is not just overweight. I think we're concerned about over fat. And yes, a big waistline is a huge indicator that there's a problem and a lot of inflammation in the body. So our focus is over fat, not just overweight. Um, and that's a huge problem. I think Dr. Kapler said it uh, correctly, uh, uh, systemic inflammation and nothing good that ever comes out uh, ever comes from that. The one study that I saw recently, uh, which was a paradox, showed that um, in men with advanced prostate cancer who were a bit overweight, not obese, fared better than those who were um, not overweight. Um, and uh, I guess when you're on chemotherapy or something with advanced prostate cancer, then you want to have some substance, even if it's some fat, because you, you need it because you start becoming, cachexia is one of the biggest killers in uh, with patients with chemotherapy. So maybe that's why, I don't know, I, I didn't understand that. Well, that's a paradox because studies do show that um, men who are overweight have a higher tendency for getting prostate cancer and for getting uh, advanced prostate cancer and even dying from it. So, uh, but overall, it's a problem. High fat, not over fat, being over fat, not just being overweight. Let's be clear. Can I say some other, one other thing? The problem also becomes visceral, visceral uh, fat, right? That's the, that is the main problem, um, which is the fat around your organs. Um, I do see a lot of people that are slim fat, right? So they're slim but fat. They have a lot of fat, a lot of fat in their in their bodies, and I think that's I think that that's a a big problem because most people tend to gauge their level of health whether they're slim or fat, and I think that slim fat people um, think they're healthy. And when I look at their labs and when we do a body composition, their fat levels are 30% or higher, which is pretty high. So I think there's something there that needs to be addressed and looked at, which a lot of, um, uh, there's been no really big trials and studies on, on that particular area that I think it's important. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna go back to the last question that we debated on about fish and protein. Oh, just, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing it. <laughs> I, I do just want to clarify, just, you know, because it's okay. Everyone's allowed to have any thought. But I do want to clarify that, um, and I'm a conference organizer, not a researcher. But we have had 75 speakers, and, you know, a good um, 40 of them were on, on diet and nutrition. All of them, 100%, you know, I could read their names, Milton Mills, Steve Blake, um, you know, Nick Delgado, Josh Elman, Julian Heaver, David Wolf, Gabriel Cousins, Sunil Pai, Pam Popper, um, Alan Goldhammer, Baxter Montgomery, uh, you know, on and on the list goes, Brian Clement, Anna Marie Clement, T. Colin Campbell, Caldwell Lesselstyn, Joel Kahn, Kim Williams, um, Robert Osfeld, Will Tuttle, you know, on and on, a hundred percent of them are saying, to definitely avoid fish completely for health reasons based on scientific research. They're saying that one, and 100% of them is saying that on a whole food plant-based diet, they never see protein deficiencies. Now, they could all be wrong, that's possible, but they're all claiming that they've been researching this for many, many years. They, they, they provide research, they have involved PowerPoints, they're heart surgeons. Um, so just, I wanna clarify, I don't wanna leave this loose, You know, I wanna be clear. Uh, like for you, Dr. Espinosa, are you saying, I know your focus is on prostate cancer and you do great work with that. And I know maybe I caught you off guard with questions that you haven't focused on, but is it possible that this is not an area that you focus as much on and you are trying to just be more open-minded to bring more people into the nutrition conversation 
um, where maybe this conference is people who are very devoted to the exact truth, they're not feeling loose at all. Do you still feel that, um, I just, how do you want to, how should our audience interpret the fact that you're saying something different than 35 other speakers on, on news? How should our audience interpret this? So I think I do a decent amount of research on nutrition. I, I can't say I look at everything because it's uh, impossible, right? And I've looked at uh, um, the research on, on fish and fish consumption as much as I can. I'm sure somebody can send me some research on it that you, know, you have to look at the preponderance of research when you look at research, not just one or two papers. At least that's how I do it. And so what I am saying is A, and it's probably, uh, I'm probably over saying this, I think it is possible to get enough protein from a plant-based diet, for sure. I think it's very difficult for a lot of people, but certainly not impossible, clearly, okay? I think that fish is uh, particularly salmon, and I want to be, and I want to emphasize that because salmon is low in mercury and has nutritional value, particularly if it's not farm raised and so forth. I think that's helpful and important. Sardines are as well, by the way, very low in mercury, nutritional value there. I, th I do think that some fats are essential, of course, and that's why that's part of the reason why I think that they're good and important. And I think that the type of conference that you have is, is uh, Steve, is one that is sort of like a plant-based type of conference. So it's gonna, you're gonna draw more of the same type of people. I don't, I don't know that you would have invited me if, if, if you would have known that I promote uh, the consumption of things like salmon. Uh, I'm only joking. I, I know you knew that from before we, we, we had conversations. Um, look, I think that, I think that, um, um, we want to set people up to, to succeed and not fail. And I think when we're overly restrictive, where there is very little to no evidence, I think we are making them more restrictive and it becomes a problem. We want to set people up to, to, to live a healthier lifestyle. And diet is one important component of that. Certainly not the only thing. I even give people cheat days to do whatever they want uh, because I think it's more uh, sustainable in the long term, in the long game. As opposed to don't don't eat don't ever don't ever have a, don't ever have a steak ever don't ever, no my god you do that you're gonna die from I, I don't do that I don't do fear mongering and I just look again my approach is look at the research I have I've seen a lot of research look at the preponderance of the research not one last study and look at the conclusion and that's it um, and then look at what I uh, my own experience for 25 years been in, through every diet possible. And, and then I look at what I see clinically and that's how I form my, uh, my approaches and my opinions. That's, that's as best as I could do. Well, you know, I just like, I just ask the audience to look around you, you know, look in your past. You, you've met thousands of people. How many cases of protein deficiency have you seen? I've never seen one. I've never heard of one. I've never read about one. In fact, I've read that it's impossible to design a diet it's protein deficient based around any natural diet. Protein deficiency means, um, so you, it, is, it technically is get the consumption of all the important amino acids. I know the important amino acids, I bet better than you do. And, you know, oh, perhaps, I'm not, perhaps. Open, I'm, just letting, I'm just letting the audience, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people that will hear this. Excuse me. Uh, they have all the amino acids. And, and this is again, nonsense that causes people to pick the wrong foods and the consequences, their health. And you're not talking about something minor. You're talking about heart disease and breast cancer and prostate cancer and rheumatoid arthritis. And- From what? From protein? Earth. From eating too much protein? From picking high protein foods because they believe the nonsense that you're trying to spread. No, that's not true at all. Um, at least from a prostate cancer perspective, that's an oversimplification that people are eating more protein and then getting prostate cancer. That's not true at all. In fact, I see many vegans with prostate cancer come to my office and many vegans who have high risk prostate cancer come to my office. So I, I don't, I don't, that's an oversimplification. Well, you can mark every word I said. <laughs> You've never seen a case of protein deficiency. You've never seen a case of- immunity. I'm not saying that they have prostate cancer because they have a protein deficiency, but no, I'm saying- what I, what, You see, uh, you're misinterpreting what I just said. You, you, you allowed me to speak some words and then you went back to what you were only hearing yourself. I said the foods that are sold as high protein, the ones that people pick, 
looking for protein are the ones that give them prostate cancer. That's not true. That's she not true. It is. I that is not true. Well that is not you. true. In fact, I, I challenge you to send me, I'll give you my email, send me one paper on that. And here's why. Because when you look at the, when you look at the, at, when you look at these studies closely, they don't say that meat consumption increases the risk of prostate cancer. If you look at it closely, what they do say is that processed meats increases the, the, the risk and uh, meats cooked in high temperature increases the risk, not meats themselves. And that's a, that's a major difference. So, and I don't think that you need a red meat, for example, to prevent anything, by the way. I'm not promote, I'm just saying that I am looking at the literature objectively and clo and I don't promote paleo and I'm not, I don't get invited to paleo conferences or anything. I'm just letting, I'm just saying that consumption of proteins is not connected necessarily to uh, prostate cancer, which is the area that I focus on, so. Well, I think we've beaten that subject to death. And I think I've made myself absolutely clear. You are, and I think I am as well. And I think it's not convincing that well, I, I you have to go true. only vegan. Now, there, and, and I do appreciate some of the environmental aspects of it. Um, and I think that the reduction of some of these things it will, would be important because of that. And we could do a whole lot better there for sure. I think what you're saying is in line with what we see so many experts, so to speak, talk about, about how it's difficult, how there's, there's this, this way you can get out of the explanation or that way. You know, the truth is simple and easy to understand. The rich Western diet gives people- Yeah, but your, your truth is not universal truth, Dr. McDougall. Your, truth, your truth, your truth is not universal uh, truth. Would you stop interrupting me, please? You know, I, 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 go, Steve, take control of this thing. Okay, so let, let's move on from this. I will note that um, just, Everyone can come to their own conclusions, but I do want to note that for our conference, the 75 speakers, um, they are saying, the 40 people who spoke on nutrition all were saying that a whole food plant-based diet that does not include fish um, is better than one that does include fish. And they are saying that they are not aware of protein deficiencies. So again, I'm a conference organizer, but this is a you know, I would say unanimous among all these speakers. Um, it doesn't mean that they're right, but I just want to point out that that was what the rest of the conference did say. I'll move on now. Okay. Great. Um, what advice do you have for people with food addictions or who, or who are overweight, sick, and lack motivation? Many people have tried to diet and eat, and eat healthy only to fail and just give up. You go in order, Dr. McDougall, Dr. Clapper, and Dr. Espinosa. You know, that's, that's a hard thing to, people ask me often, who, who do I think will follow the type of diet that I recommend or the type of diet that's recommended by the bulk of the people in this conference? He froze. Uh, I think we did, Dr. McDougall, did, you did freeze. Go ahead, Dr. McDougall. Oh, okay, Dr. Clapper, why don't you take over and then we'll go back to Dr. McDougall. Uh, well, um... You know, it's been uh, an age old observation that most vegans get skinny, they get lean, you know, well, why is that? And uh, I'm not saying you, you wanna be underweight, but most, most people who adopt a whole, whole food plant-based diet uh, wind up with a fairly lean slender body. Why is it? Because the majority of the food that's going down their gullet, the salads and soups and steamed veggies are mostly fiber and water. The, the, um, the calorie density of the food is so low that if you fill your belly up with a, with a bowl of vegetable soup and a big salad, some steamed greens, you, you've eaten a couple hundred calories maybe. And, and that's the beauty of a whole food plant-based diet. It's guilt-free eating. You don't have to count carbs. You don't have to count calories. Eat till you're full. And as long as they're whole foods, you know, if you're getting into the potato chips and the baked goods, that, that's a whole other game. But if you're eating whole plant foods, you know, eat all you want and you're going to wind up getting lean. Be careful with the nut butters and, uh, and the baked goods, and, you know, flour products, oils, uh, uh, dried fruits. Those can be plant-based saboteurs. But if you're eating whole foods like they grew in the garden, you know, rice, I mean, uh, tomatoes and beans and uh, cucumbers, 
uh, you're going to get pretty lean uh, just because of the nature of the food. It's low calorie density food. So um, if, if someone goes back for a fourth bowl of vegetable soup, who cares? If you're, you're going to pee out the water and poop out the fiber. It doesn't matter a heck of a lot. So, um, so uh, I would tell them, relax. You focus on healthy plant-based foods. You focus on uh, you know, high fiber foods that satisfy you and the weight will take care of itself. The vast majority of people uh, who whole, maintain a whole food plant-based diet for 6, 12, 18 months, they wind up uh, at, at an ideal body weight. So uh, I, I do very little weight counseling with most of my patients. Um, and um, and I, I do want to give some deference to Dr. Espinosa's uh, plight and position that he's dealing with a population of pretty unhealthy folks who don't have a lot of food consciousness, it sounds. And, and he's right. He can't, you know, from day one, you must go whole food plant-based and never eat another piece of meat again. Uh, humans aren't going to do that. And if people need to take a few months to taper it off, to get their meat eating down to once or twice a week, beats once or twice a day, uh, and uh, and then, but but I work with you. The idea is to wean yourself off of this over the next X number of months, whatever it chooses to be, and work with them to come up with nice substitutes, etc. Nice high protein uh, lentils and uh, lentil stews and bean burritos, etc. Um, then uh, I have no problem with them easing off of that. Uh, you know, it's not an all or nothing thing. And I, I think a lot of that salmon, notwithstanding. Is, is what he's, uh, you know, he's trying to deal with there. And, and I give him credit for uh, being uh, sensitive to his, uh, uh, to his patient's uh, food patterns there. You gotta, you gotta work with where you're at. He's doing a good job with that. I appreciate that. Um, look, I, again, I, I, I do look at the research. It's not like I'm pulling information out of the air. I've read Dr. Campbell's book, great book, China Study. Um, but I look at everything as a preponderance of research and I make decisions to my patients, even what I wouldn't necessarily do because who cares about what my dogma or bias opinion is about a diet or anything. So what they care about, what's important for them for the condition that they have. And I spend a lot of time on looking at it, that information. And as you can tell, I'm not really um, emotionally attached to diet that much. I just care to do whatever's right for patients and to do whatever's right for myself. I think that overconsumption of energy is the primary problem. I think we overeat, period, end of story. Yes, if you're eating broccoli all day, you still have a very low calorie count because there's very little calories in broccoli and vegetables, of course. But that's what more, that's not, people don't snack on broccoli. Like we, we have to bring it to the real world. I mean, with the exception probably of Dr. Kapler and Dr. McDougall and a few others that are listening, people are not snacking on celery. They're, they're snacking when they snack, they snack on, you know, other things, um, uh, beef chews, which I don't support. Right. So I, I have to, my job is to get them from where they're at to a better place so that we can create, if it's, if it deals with prostate cancer, so we can create a micro environment in their body that's hostile to cancer, um, which slow inflammation and all these other things are a big part of that. And based on my research, I give them that kind of protocol and, it, um, uh, and that's that. Um, but I didn't answer your question, Steve. And since we don't have Dr. McDougall, um, I maybe, back. oh, okay. Um, we can't see you, at least I can't well, see hold you. Hold on a minute, I had a complete computer failure, believe me. I'm hey, Steve, what, um, can you repeat the question? I just wanna make sure I'll give you 30 seconds. I need to answer your question specifically, I'm sorry. Am we, I we, back I, with you? Yeah, you are. Yeah, right. um, I said, what advice do you have for people with food addictions or who are overweight, sick, and lack motivation? Yeah. Many people have tried to diet and eat healthy only to fail and just give up. That was so can I, can, can I, um, can I, I'll address that specific question. I, I believe there's no bigger addiction than food addiction. Yeah. People will say, well, no, I was addicted to alcohol and that's much bigger and more serious. Yeah, I agree. I was addicted to something. But in terms of nobody, when you're eating a big plate of food, nobody's going to look at you and say, hey, stop that. You need to go to uh, Overeaters Anonymous. No one is ever going to say that. So in terms of feasibility and, um, and the addictive nature of, of course, processed foods, um, I think that's a, that's a huge problem, okay, and, and so forth. So how do you get them? Um, that's a whole story. And I don't, I don't think we have enough time because I do deal with people that are food addicted. And my main question is, you know, 
what's your purpose? What's your, what's your why in life? Because that's going to get you to say, I'm not going to eat that cookie. Um, if you want to see your daughter grow up and, and, and walk her down the wet aisle when she gets married, then you need to stop eating that cookie or overeating those cookies. Um, so it's, it's a matter of what's your why, as opposed to, you know, I'm not, because again, it's an addictive behavior. And as it relates to being overweight, that's a simple calculation of, of ca uh, calorie um, deficit, calorie deficit, more exercise, care, care, careful to know simple carbohydrates and people will lose weight. Here's the deal though. People out there are slim fat, slim fat. So just because they're losing weight, yeah, they'll lose some fat, but a lot of that is water. They're losing, initially, they're losing a lot of water. So I, I think people need to measure with whether some uh, a DEXA scan or something, they need to measure their body composition yeah. to see how much of their body is fat versus muscle. And that is uh, a, certainly a concern of mine. I've seen people, uh, many people that are in healthy advanced prostate cancer that are slim. I don't know why I can, I cannot oversimplify why, but I look at their body composition as like 35% fat, even though they're slim. So I think there, that, that's an issue that needs to be addressed. Okay. Um, we had a Dr. Seyfried uh, speak recently, and he, I believe, is a professor at Boston College. And he's saying that a lot of the theories on cancer are not correct, and that it's not um, a genetic disease it's basically, uh, he, he's saying that it's fed by glutamine and glucose. He said, those are the two things that are feeding cancer cells. Right. Um, and he said, there's a meter you could get to check your glutamines and glucose. I might have that wrong. There's some kind of meter you could check it. But just in general, um, does this mean that we need to be careful with fruit in your mind? If he's saying that glucose feeds cancer cells, does that mean that we need to be uh, careful with fruit? Um, and Brian Clement also quotes Thomas Seyfried a lot and says that he feels that fruit feeds yeast mold, cancer, fungus, candida, and cancers, and he personally recommends minimizing it. Um, this is not the belief of most whole food plant-based eaters, but does anyone feel that uh, fruit sugar uh, is a concern? Fruit is probably the worst food anyone can eat. I'm just joking. I'm just kind of pressing on Dr. McDougal. Get, get him a little bit agitated. You want me to answer that, Steve? I'm sorry. You want me to? I'll answer that. All three of you answer it. Yeah, sure. So I know Thomas C. Fried's work and as it relates to cancer is the, um, uh, the, the idea that sugar feeds cancer. It's a meta metabolic approach to cancer. And so he promotes the ketogenic diet, which I think Dr. McDougall and Dr. Klaper would love the fact that I don't promote the ketogenic diet for prostate cancer, because it turns out that, um, so the research that indicates that sugar feeds cancer applies to many sugar, uh, excuse me, many types of cancers, including glioblastomas and things. It does not apply to prostate cancer. It does not. Have, so prostate cancer is not a glycolytic type of cancer like many others. Actually, I think you guys are going to really like this. It seems like it's more lipogenic. So fats, too much fat is likely more contributory to prostate cancer that, than, uh, than, than, well, simple sugars are a problem because of the insulin response and insulin is a problem for all cancers, including prostate cancer. So let's just get that out of the way. But in terms of fruits and particularly fruits that are low glycemic that don't really cause a, uh, insulin response and, um, and they don't, the, the sugar in fruits or in low glycemic foods do not promote prostate cancer. Um, and because it's not glycolytic. So the whole note, Thomas of uh, Seafried and the um, Wahlberg effect, that's what that's about, um, does not apply to prostate cancer as it, or I think breast cancer, but that's not my specialty, as it applies likely to glioblastoma uh, of the brain and pancreatic cancer, for example, which that's not the area of expertise, but I know that the, they behave differently metabolically. So um, no, I think that um, low glycemic fruits are great. And I think that after I run 
five miles, six miles, eight miles, when I go for a run, my body just wants a nice squeeze, fresh squeezed orange juice. I'm craving that because there I'm not going to get that insulin response after exercise. So a, it depends on the type of a fruit and most fruits that are low glycemic are great therapeutic. They have phytochemicals that actually have anti-cancer properties. So we want that. And B, uh, in some fruits that are a little bit more high glycemic or fruit juice, it seems to be fine as long as the person exercises quite a bit. I, I typically recommend four to six hours a week of exercise with moderate to uh, with moderate intensity to high intensity. So if people do that, then um, they can do that. Uh, so that's that. I'll keep it there. John? You're, You're muted. muted. Yeah. You're muted. You're muted, John. You got to unmute your microphone, John. Uh, un unmute Do his microphone. facial expression. I'm afraid I'm going <laughs> to. I don't like that facial expression. I'm telling you. I'm going to have. I'm going to have nightmares. It's Good Friday. I should have nightmares on Good Friday. Yeah, I obviously didn't get my last statement out. I asked you if you'd stop interrupting me. Oh. I stopped. You're asking me if I stopped. No, I say, will you stop interrupting me? Oh, sure, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah, that's that's how I ended it before my computer went dead, which I apologize for. Yeah, I, I'd like to be able to speak, but I don't feel like getting talked over. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Otto Warburg's uh, work has been misinterpreted by people who believe that sugar promotes cancer. Otto Warburg, what he determined was that this was due to a respiratory problem of the mitochondria. And because of damage to the mitochondria and the respiratory system of the cells, uh, they turn to anaerobic glycolysis as opposed to aerobic glycolysis. Well, that finding about Otto Warburg, which you can read about, and I certainly have many times, has been misinterpreted by the people who promote sugar, promotes cancer. It starts with that basic misinformation, always promoting Otto Warburg, yet they obviously don't understand his work. The other thing you have to do is you have to look around the world and you see where cancers are rare and where they're common. Where they're common, and this has been something that's been discovered since 1950, that people have been doing this type of, uh, of study of the, uh, the worldwide distribution of cancers, breast, colon, prostate. Uh, these cancers are, are cancers that are confined primarily to parts of the world where we eat the Western diet. Uh, parts of the world, like I mentioned, uh, and you should know this, uh, parts of the world, such as Japan, before they switched to the Western diet, they didn't have prostate cancer. And as you mentioned, prostate cancer is quite rare still in the Asians, but they're catching up as they're switching to the Western diet. It's the, the animal foods and the free oils. You know, you can take, you can look at all kinds of details. Uh, you can look at the uh, environmental poisons. I just told you how you get the environmental poisons. They come up through the food chain. Uh, yeah, they're a problem. Uh, fat promotes cancer uh, in experimental studies. Vegetable fat pro promotes cancer. But there are all kinds of things about the rich Western diet that cause people to be sick. Many components, and they probably don't work independently. They probably work together. And that's why I, I would encourage the listener to step back and not get involved in the details, but look at the big picture. When you eat a diet of rich foods, you end up fat and sick. When you eat a diet of starches based on corn and rice and potatoes, as people have for hundreds of thousands of years, they've lived on starch-based diets. Then they're trim, healthy, hardworking, they're warriors. And from that simple fact, you ought to be able to build everything else. Everything else ought to fit and be true. I find the scientific research, if I read the methods carefully, and of course I read who funded the study, I find the scientific research is consistent and clear. I find uh, the history is, just, is clear and consistent. I find people's religions, what they teach them about good diets and how people get sick is consistent and clear. I don't find any inconsistency and you shouldn't. The truth is simple and easy to understand. Don't make, don't, don't make it so complex that you don't know what to do. You need to eat a diet based on starch with the addition of fruits and vegetables, get a little sunshine, a little moderate exercise, and clean habits, of course. And that's basically it. Thank you for not interrupting. Sure. 
I uh, don't have much to add. I, um, I agree generally what's been said here. It's surprising to me that prostate uh, cancer is not, uh, if one does a PET scan where radioactive uh, labeled sugar is injected. Um, you, uh, cannot, you cannot find cancer in the prostate uh, during that, in that uh, PET scan. So that is the analogy that's typically used. It doesn't apply for prostate cancer. Very interesting. I was not aware of that. Thank yep. you. That's true. I appreciate that. Yep. But anyway, it's hard to believe someone with cancer uh, can't eat an apple or have some blueberries on their oatmeal. It really is. It's hard for me to believe that that poses a great threat uh, to their long distance of well-being there. Um, should they be drinking fruit juices and guzzling, you know, eating four pounds of grapes in front of the TV? No, they shouldn't. Should they be eating two pounds of dried apricot? No, they shouldn't. Uh, but uh, whole fruits in, in, in you know, moderation, small moderation, I think are absolutely acceptable. And, and I think uh, it doesn't make sense to, uh, uh, to eliminate the, all the good things, like Dr. Espinosa said, uh, that fruits can bring into the diet, including anti-cancer effects. So I think uh, moderate fruit consumption is fine, even if one has a neoplasm in the body. Thank you. Um Regarding blood sugar, um, there's some, there's some uh, statistic I read that um, like 100 million Americans have either uh, diabetes or prediabetes. So uh, the question is, if someone sticks to a diet of uh, whole beans and whole grains with potatoes and squashes, is there a concern that if you eat too much of those, that that could raise your blood sugar too much? Do you need to eat it with a lot of vegetables? Is there, do you have to moderate the amount? Do you have any thought about uh, making sure that your blood sugar stays in an appropriate level if you're on a diet of beans and grains and potatoes and squashes? We start with Dr. McDougall and Dr. Clapper and then Dr. Espinosa. Well, I, you know, I'm a real doctor. I, I really see patients. And a lot of the patients that I see have type two diabetes. Uh, many of them have type one and a half diabetes. Many of them have type one diabetes. And they worry about that. They worry about whether or not eating carbohydrates will raise their blood sugar. And it does right after you eat, but that's what's supposed to happen is your blood sugar is supposed to go up after you eat. But in the long, the long run, that's not a problem. 100% of type two diabetics are curable with a change to a healthy diet and associated weight loss. You know, type one diabetics, they require about, a, about two thirds as much insulin when they switch from the fats to the sugars, to the carbohydrates. So, you know, in the long run, you're looking at a cure if you pick the right kind of diet. Uh, even in the short run, not, not talking about just after a meal, but even in the short run over the next, uh, say, few days or few weeks, your blood sugars are going to get much better, particularly if you're a type two diabetic, even a type one, like say, I typically drop the uh, the insulin in my type one diabetic patients uh, to two thirds of what they were taking. And then the journal Diabetic Cares in the year 2013, they show that when you feed type one diabetics, fat, oils, that you increase their insulin needs. You know, it's just the fats and oils that paralyze the insulin, it's not the sugars. As a matter of fact, a guy named Brunzel in 1972 published in the New England Journal of Medicine, how He's from University of Washington. He showed how type two diabetics, when you increase the simple sugar from 45% of the calories, and this was simple sugar, this wasn't starch, to 85% of the calories, every aspect of their diabetes got better. Their insulin levels were less, their 24 hour blood sugars were less, the morning blood sugars were, were decreased. And what they concluded in this New England Journal of Medicine article by Brunzel is that sugar increases the sensitivity of insulin and makes it work better. So, you know, again, there, people come to some incorrect conclusions. They haven't read the science. They don't really understand what's going on. And of course the public is scared to death because of this misinformation. And by the way, I'm giving a lecture on Sunday on uh, this particular issue on diabetes. Um, could our tech team come in for a second, John? Can you help Ms. Dr. McDougall? There is a, we are getting again a little breaking in his microphone. Are you able? We, I could hear it, but it was a little bit. Are you able to help him at all? Hey, Dr. McDougall, um, can you just maybe lower the gain on that? All right. How's that? Better. Better. Okay. 
We good? Okay, uh, Dr. Clapper. Yeah, well, I'm Dr. I agree uh, tonight, I guess. Uh, Dr. McDougall, you know, especially towards the end of his explanation, really, I think, uh, hit the key concept. Uh, type 2 diabetes is a disease of fat toxicity. The problem is not um, blood, is not sugars. Um, and uh, Dr. Harvey Shirley in the 1920s uh, showed this very graphically. He took a bunch of medical students. Uh, half of them he put on a high sugar diet, he had to eat white bread and, and, and crystalline sugars, and he has a high sugar diet. Um, and then did a glucose tolerance test on them. They're absolutely normal. It did not interfere with their ability to handle sugars. But then he gave uh, the other group of med students a high fat diet. They were drinking olive oil, eating butter, uh, just a huge amount of fat. They all want diabetic in their glucose tolerance curves. Uh, when they went back to a high carbohydrate diet, the, the, the uh, glucose intolerance went away immediately. It was completely reversible, but it was just a graphic demonstration that it's the fat clogging up the insulin receptors. Uh, and it's from the high fat diet that people are eating bacon and eggs for breakfast, cheeseburgers for lunch, chicken for dinner. It's a high fat diet. And they're walking around with clogged up insulin receptors. So when they eat some carbohydrates, whoa, blood sugar goes up. And they, oh, avoid those sugars. But it's really the fat that's clogging up the insulin receptors. The, the high sugars, that, that's the tail of the dog. That, that's the effect. That's not the cause. And as Dr. McDougall said, the, when we eat a high carbohydrate diet, our insulin works better. Not, uh, and uh, the, the, the fellow Andrew down in, uh, Andrew Taylor down in Australia ate potatoes for a year. Uh, and, uh, and he wound up, he lost weight, got trim, and he had a great glucose tolerance after eating potatoes constantly for a year. So, um, so eating a diet high in whole carbohydrates, uh, not colas and Oreos, uh, whole carbohydrates uh, should not put you in danger of, of uh, diabetes for sure. And it, uh, should you be walking out high high blood insulins all day. You should, I don't think you should be a grazer just eating carbohydrates all day because you're walking around with high insulin levels all day. As Dr. Espinosa says, that may be pro everything, inflammatory, carcinogenic, et cetera. So eat three honest meals a day, two honest meals, and one honest meal a day is just fine, actually. Uh, and uh, But don't be afraid of carbohydrates in their whole form, the rice and potatoes. Uh, that's what we were meant to, to eat. We are starchivores. Uh, the ancient Paleolithic folks did not eat mammoth meat for their calorie supply. They, the women spent all day digging up roots and tubers and uh, bringing back starches. Uh, and we were starchivores then, we're starchivores now. So, um, so the rice and potatoes don't pose a problem. Yeah, I think the, 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 the biggest problem, um, sorry, I'm at risk of being repetitive. The biggest problem is overconsumption of food. Um, I think that's the biggest problem we face of all macronutrients. Um, we don't need that much food. And a lot of that is dependent on how much energy you expel, but I'm a pretty active guy and I do intermittent fasting 16, 20 hours a day sometimes. Um, and I, you know, nothing, nothing, there's no problems. So I think that, um, I think, and I think I find it difficult to believe that a high whole, whole food starch diet, like sweet potato and things like that. First of all, my, I don't think many people can eat too much of those kind of foods. You get, you know, that is so nutrient dense that you get filled. And so you don't eat that much. Um, so I, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think most people would do it uh, or can do it. And I think, um, I think the, I think it, uh, the, the main thing is um, less cut back in, in all the eating that we do and less practice either fasting, which is a great thing or intermittent fasting, which is a really good thing. Um, are we trying to avoid all salt or do we need some? We're starting with the list again. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I think, um, well, if you, if you try to help people with a low salt diet, it's usually a failure. The, the, the actual reduction in blood pressure when you go on a low salt, typical low salt diet, reducing the sodium by 1,750 milligrams a day down to what is recommended of 3,500 milligrams a day. The drop in blood pressure is the top number is about three to five millimeters of mercury. And the bottom number is about six tenths of a millimeter of mercury, not very much at all. You have to make a change in the whole diet to get the effects. 
the only exception to that, I would say, would be if you use something like the Kempner diet, which is extremely low in sodium, then you can have profound drops in blood pressure. There, there's a whole argument out there, and I think there's, it's valid that low salt diets can be harmful. Uh, we're naturally seekers of salt. If you remember the tip of the tongue tastes with pleasure, minerals, salt. I don't think we'd be designed that way if it wasn't important for us to take in these minerals, including salt. Uh, there, there, I could go into all kinds of discussions about the adrenal system, the effects of angiotensin uh, in relation to a low salt diet and how you eat a low salt diet, you increase your adrenal hormones and that raises the blood pressure. It gets very complicated. So I guess, I guess the way what I would tell you is what we explain to people is you should eat the basic diet that we recommend, which is a diet that's 90% starch with fruits and vegetables. And you can add without any deleterious effect in most people, about a half a teaspoon of salt on the surface of the food a day. If you add it on the surface, you get a lot of taste for a minimum amount of sodium. So that's the way that I deal with it. Uh, but I, I think it's an overblown uh, recommendation to eat a low salt diet. People expect too much and they don't get the results they're looking for. They have to change the food. Uh, the man said it uh, exactly right again. Uh, I, you know, I was, when I worked at True North, you know, uh, no salt, no salt. And I hope Dr. Goldhammer is not listening, uh, but I'm now of the camp. I agree with Dr. Gold, uh, Dr. McDougall. Um, a, a no salt diet, to, you know, there's a bell shaped curve. Most people can handle it, but there's definitely people out at the tail of the curve there who one needs some sodium. They have low blood pressure. They, they stand up, they're skinny folks. They stand up, their blood pressure drops and they do better with some salt in their diet. And just regular folks who don't have hypertension. Uh, Dr. McDougall said, you know, a half a teaspoon of salt a day, that's right. Uh, and spread over three meals uh, basically, a pinch of salt is about an eighth of a teaspoon, and so that's, you know, and a half teaspoon, so it's three-eighths there. Um, and so a pinch of salt, literally, on the surface of your veggies, um, I think can really add a lot of uh, flavor enjoyment, because as you already implied, the crystals are on the surface of the veggie, so the, the salt crystals hit your tongue, you get this big salty flavor without a lot of actual sodium there. So uh, I don't have a problem with a pinch of salt on the surface of the veggies, uh, an eighth of a teaspoon with each meal. Uh, I, I, I've not seen any studies showing that the salt on that level used in that way causes any problem. The real problem with the sodium there is the huge amount of processed food. It's in this, the salt in the spaghetti sauce at the Italian restaurant, the soy sauce in the Asian restaurant, um, then the package and the frozen dinners, et cetera. That's where the sodium's coming in and you can't control it. There's nothing you can do about it. It's already in the food. But so if you're not eating the processed stuff and you're minimizing your restaurant exposure there, um, I think a, literally a pinch of salt on the surface of your veggies uh, a couple times a day is, is acceptable. And uh, Dr. Goldhammer, you didn't hear me say that, but I did. Um, one interruption. Uh, we're still getting a little bit of static. Uh, John on our tech team, do you have anything else you could do? I just heard a little with Dr. Clapper. Do we have any other options? It's, it's tolerable, but rather get it perfect. Well, let's see. I don't know. If, I'm talking to the, our John, not you. I'm not. Oh, okay. It's not me, huh? Not you. I'm talking to our John. Are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Do we have any any options? I just heard a little more fuzz with Dr. Clapper speaking. Uh, um, I just moved my microphone. Maybe that'll help. Hmm. That sounds sounds okay on, on my end. Okay, we'll continue. Uh, Dr. Espinosa, go ahead. I think that um, so. Um, yeah, salt is actually important. Um, I, I don't, I don't think table salt is what we should uh, seek for. Things like sea salt or Himalayan sea salt is better. Have more of the electrolytes. I think that water drinking just simply H two O without minerals in it and electrolytes is more of a problem than a good thing. I think what we want from fluid when we talk about hydration is more than just H two O. We're talking about salt, sodium, potassium, chloride. That's hydration. And so that's important. And so I think it's important to eat it. I think it's important. I also see athletes and people that do all kinds of athletic events, just drinking water. Um, um, 
um, without electrolytes, which I think it's, it's important. Um, so, and when I introduce electrolytes, they, they feel a lot better. No, none of this orthostatic hypotension where the blood pressure comes down um, and other issues with, um, with, with just a low salt uh, diet. So uh, A, again, anything in excess, that's the other thing. Anything in excess becomes a problem, even too much water, right? So, um, but I think we are so concerned about sodium that most people are not taking either the right kinds or they're taking too little. Um, and I think that it, there's some benefit from, um, but from taking some sodium and no, no worries of hypertension. Okay. Um, three different questions. Uh, Dr. McDougall, when we talk about starch, <clears throat> are you talking about beans and whole grains? And is there one that you prefer? Is it better to have chickpeas, lentils, white beans, black eyed peas than it is to have quinoa, millet, amaranth, teff, buckwheat, and wild rice? Or are they both the same? That's your question. Dr. Clapper, um, there are so, I got an email right before this conference started from a woman who was very mad at me and said, there's an author who knows more than the authors who were speaking. And he says that the best oils are saturated fats such as coconut oil, ghee, butter, and lard. And I want to know what the best science says about that. And Dr. Espinosa, um, how do you treat prostate cancer if you get it? What works and what doesn't? And what percent of the time? And can you treat it naturally with watchful waiting? So Dr. McDougall, would you start? I think uh, any of the starches are fine. They've supported millions of people in different parts of the world and different times in history. And they've all been successful populations. Uh, I, I would want to add one thing, and that is there's a, a lot of concern about white rice. We don't recommend white rice in our program. We recommend whole grain rice. But I have to tell you, white rice is not a deal breaker. As I mentioned before, there are 2 billion Asians who, before 1980, over 90% of their diet was white rice. And they're a very successful population of people. It's, it's not a battle I want to get into with my patients. I would rather deal with the things that really count, which are the two major food poisons, which are animal foods and free oils. And people are starch eaters. They're starchivores, they're starchitarians. Until they figure that out, they won't be in control. Everything will be too complicated. You won't get it right. It's very simple, folks. You eat a traditional diet. I uh, certainly agree with that, especially the last line there. Um, that this man is saying that coconut oil and lard are good for you. Um, this is just, I, I, you know, I'm just gobsmacked. I don't know where to start uh, uh, to, to answer that. Um, the, as I said way earlier in this, uh, that uh, oils, you know, leap into your bloodstream. They, they injure the function of your arteries, of your insulin receptors. Of, they interfere with blood clotting. They make your blood, uh, coconut oil makes your blood more viscous. Lard makes your blood more viscous. It's more likely to clot um, or uh, uh, decrease oxygen delivery. Um, the, 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 he the, 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 uh, you know, it's, uh, really difficult to uh, come up with a rational answer like that. As Dr. McDougall just said, the to toxins are animal products and oils. Well, I, I agree with that. So um, uh, I, I would like him to show me the studies, show me the studies uh, that people who eat uh, half a cup of coconut oil or lard, two pounds of lard a day, whatever it is, uh, follow them along for 20 years, 30 years, and show me that they don't develop artery disease and cancers and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, various other maladies there. Um, it's a silly argument, I think, and uh, that's all I can really say about that. Uh, like Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. But I really am interested in hearing uh, seriously about Dr. Espinosa, because I got a couple of patients non-vegan uh, with uh, prostate cancer, and I like to know how he, he does treat it. And uh, you, sir, you did mention, you, you said, I see lots of vegans with prostate cancer. Really? How many vegans with prostate cancer do, have you seen in this last year? And, uh, and over the course of your practice, is it really a common problem among plant-eating folks? Hold on one second again. John, is there anything we could do to help him? With the, We're getting feedback again. Is there anything on our from, end? We, from me or? I, I from, can't tell. John, you with us? Yeah, uh, Dr. Clapper, um, can, I'm, can I bring him to another room for a second? 
Uh, should I, uh, I'm gonna talk really, I hear if I talk right into the microphone, it sounds better. Is that, is oh, that okay? You know, Michael sounds really good from, from what I'm right. listening to. I don't hear any feedback, just okay. if that helps. Uh, okay, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Sounds good? Okay. Sounds clear enough. to me, Michael. Sounds okay. John, should we continue? Yes, uh, continue, yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, Dr. Clapper, continue. Uh, no, I'm, um, I'm over to Dr. Espinosa. I'd like to know how he treats prostate cancer for real. And, uh, and has he, is prostate cancer in vegans a big problem in as far as in his practice there? Um, I don't know that prostate cancer in vegans is a big problem. I'm saying what I said was that I've seen uh, quite a few vegans with, with prostate cancer maybe is, has nothing to do with the fact that they were vegan, but certainly wasn't pr protective in their case. And, um, and, and these are cases with advanced prostate cancer. So I don't know that I see a lot, but I've seen, uh, what I'm saying is that I've seen vegans with advanced but, prostate cancer. But you don't know how long they were vegan before. Uh, they may just say I'm I, vegan. I, yeah, I, I don't, you know, those yeah. are the details that are likely okay. important that I don't, I won't have in my head. Fair so enough. I'm okay. not. Got it. Um, okay. Watchful waiting. All right. So we'll make this as quickly as possible because that's a whole course. Um, so how do I, so you said watchful waiting. So there's a difference between watchful waiting and active surveillance. They're not the same thing. Watchful waiting means I have prostate cancer, but I'm deciding not to do anything. And if it advances and it progresses and it metastasizes, I will, I will only seek uh, palliative treatment at that point. That's watchful waiting. Active surveillance means I got diagnosed with prostate cancer, but it's very low risk disease. And we think it will not kill you, but we're going to keep a close eye on it with, uh, you know, PSA scans and so forth in case it progresses, then we're going to intervene and do something medically to it so that we can uh, in the attempt to cure you. Okay. So those are two different things. I don't treat prostate cancer medically at all. I work with it with medical doctors that do, and I refer them when I think they need medical treatment. The patients that I see with prostate cancer that do extremely well, regardless of their stage, whether it's stage one or stage four, are more compliant. The more compliant they are, the better they do. Period, end of story. So a lot of it does, do they need to be perfect? No. But when they're about 80% compliant with the protocol, they tend to do really well, assessed by their PSA, particularly PSA after they've been treated. So let's just say they got a prostatectomy, they got their prostate removed, they get a recurrence, they're ready to go to the next treatment, which is hormone deprivation, whatever it is, hormone deprivation therapy or radiation, they don't need it because their PSA is actually very stable at that point. PSA is a controversial biomarker, as we all know, but is very useful for men after they've been diagnosed with prostate cancer and treated before they're diagnosed as a treat, as a screening tool. Um, it's debatable. I think it's still helpful, but it's, um, it's helpful to determine um, just general prostate health and other things like if it's really high, it matters or the velocity if it increases very rapidly, it matters. Um, but just that absolute number um, matters less from a prostate cancer perspective. So I just wanted to give that as a side thing. Right. So when you say um, the ones that are compliant do better, compliant with what? With what yeah. program? I'm, I'm setting about? up the stage, Dr. Kapler, okay. to Thank then you. Okay. Boom, okay. give it to you all. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the, I, I think that, um, so in general, um, what I'm trying to do when, so when my medical colleagues, we have mutual patients and they're like, Gio, how do you, treat prostate cancer is amazing. This patient is doing well. I can honestly say that I don't know that I treat prostate cancer, but what I try to do is treat the micro environment and the terrain in prostate cancer. That's what I think I do. And what that means is you lower chronic inflammation, all these inflammatory markers that contribute to cancer. You stabilize insulin uh, because insulin resistance and it's a problem with prostate cancer. Um, you um, protect against oxidative stress, all the things that it's not just for prostate cancer, but in my case, this is what I do. Um, and you uh, stimulate and, and modulate the immune system because the stronger the immune system, like natural killer cells, the better they do. So that's what sort of what I mean by 
uh, the microenvironment in, in a more scientific basis. And so the more they do, the better all these things do, including, by the way, LDL. So LDL seems to be a, so LDL, which we don't know is bad cholesterol. Low LDL is actually a good thing for prostate cancer. There's been, there's been correlations there. High react, uh, biomarkers that I look at are things like LDL and C-reactive protein and hemoglobin A1C. These are all things that give me an idea of how the microenvironment is doing. There's a lot of data to support correlation between advanced prostate cancer and all these things. And all these things do well and the patient does well and the quality of life improves. And then prostate cancer becomes an opportunity for them to do better and live better as a result of that diagnosis on average or even above average. The protocol is a, a it's four things. It's diet, um, exercise, sleep, and certain nutraceuticals. And the nutraceuticals are dependent on what stage of prostate cancer they're in. The diet is, well, I think you have an idea what the diet is. It's sort of, I would, I would consider it a combined Mediterranean plant-based diet with emphasis on cruciferous vegetables because they seem to have anti-prostate cancer activity uh, more so than even other vegetables based on research. So your crucifers, a lot of those, I have them eat one or two servings of those a day. Um, let's see, what would be a controversial thing that I would advise for them dietarily that probably um, people would disagree with? I, I don't, I, they get away from, from dairy, so that's a good thing. Um, I, I guess it's as it relates to salmon and oils and nut butters and things like that, which again, the, so the diet is Mediterranean plant-based, don't eat too much and eat clean, get the best source of food you can possibly get from a local farmer's market or local farm or organic or all of the above. That's kind of in a nutshell what it is um, and some intermittent fasting. Exercise includes is four to six hours a week with moderate to high intensity. And in addition to that, more physical activity. So just sitting down for a prolonged tip period of time, um, we try to get them to get standing desks and things like that. Keep moving, keep moving. Sleep, I try to target, remember, I, a lot of my, although I see patients internationally now, um, but a lot of the ones that I see are still New Yorkers. So there's no such thing as a New Yorker being type A personality. They're either type A1 or type A2, but they're all type <laughs> A, right? So, um, so as a result, they have sleep problems. So I give them sleep um, hygiene. Uh, we spend a lot of, if that's one of their major problems, I give them some sleep hygiene tools and things to do to improve their sleep. Um, I measure it with an aura ring so we can measure their, uh, the quality of their sleep, how much time in REM and things like that. I do in moderate to advanced cases, I do give them melatonin. There's good research on melatonin showing um, decreased risk of not only cancer, prostate cancer, but advanced prostate cancer. Um, so I do give them some melatonin at night. If they have low risk disease, I may not. And uh, the nutraceuticals includes things like melatonin, depending on their situation and other, uh, really the goal to target all these points, uh, anti-inflammatory, oxidative stress prevention, things like that. So a lot of curcumin, um, vitamin D, boswellia, anti-quercetin, anti-inflammatories and so forth. In a nutshell, that's what it is. And again, they have a cheat day. They all have their cheat day. So I don't, the main thing I teach my patients is do not eat, ever eat anything with guilt. Guilt is more indigestible than any food you eat. Right. So that's the main thing. Now, that being said, let's get on the program. You're going to have one day a week to eat whatever you want. And when they get that one day a week, they don't do too badly because they feel so good. They don't want to mess it up. So, so they have one day a week for psychological reasons. So if they go to their kids or grandkids birthday party and they want to have a piece of cake, they have it without guilt. And they're enjoying that food with friends and family, because that's ultimately what it's all about. Food brings people together and you spend more time with those you love. So I never want to lose sight of the bigger picture. This is why when my mother cooks typical Cuban food, and I'm so happy, I think Dr. McDougall and I are gonna agree so much on one thing. And that's the fact that white rice is not that bad. Thank God. My mother would never wanna use brown rice for making her rice and beans. So thank goodness that's the case. I'm happy to hear that. 
Um, and she's, so she's going to cook what she cooks traditionally, and I am going to eat it and enjoy it because I'm spending good time with family and friends. I think that's very important um, to, to do that if you want to. Look, I've seen many people that go all the way, and whether it's paleo, I'm only going to eat grass-fed meat and blah, 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 and that's it. So they cannot go anywhere because the plate, or they have to bring their own food. And I've seen the vegan do that and listen, if that makes you happy, you, you know, go for it. I mean, that's great. You have way more discipline than I do, but I, I've seen many people struggle with that. Um, and, and it takes away from the unity and from the camaraderie of getting together through food. So I make sure that I tell them don't eat anything with guilt on the 80, 20 rule. And you have one cheat day. And typically, again, they don't do that poorly anyway. In a nutshell, that's what they do. And patients do absolutely amazing with that approach. Okay. What are the most significant findings in nutritional science over the last decade that people should know about? Uh, should know about, uh, what are the most significant findings in nutritional science over the last decade that people should know to take control of their health destiny? Uh, Dr. McDougall, then Dr. Clapper, then Dr. Espinosa. Well, I don't know that I can answer that. I mean, there's just such a bulk of scientific information. Uh, probably one of the uh, one of the most uh, prominent and uh, respected of all the people that has provided information, including studies on uh, treating prostate cancer, showing that you can reduce PSAs as well as reducing lesion size, is Dr. Dean Arnish. So I'd have to say that his contribution has been huge. Prior to them, there were other important people, like, for example, Nathan Pritikin and Dennis Burkett and Walter Kempner and Roy Swank, who treated multiple sclerosis at the University of at Oregon Health and Science University. So I, I don't really think there's anything that stands out in my mind as a la, it was a wonderful study, it proved everything. You know, maybe, maybe T. Colin Campbell's uh, China study would be something worth talking about that made a big impression. But otherwise, uh, I don't know of any particular study that's come to a conclusion that would sway me. Just a lot of information. Thank you. Uh, the most exciting and uh, I think monumental concept that's been coming up through the research um, is the concept of disease reversal. Uh, I wish when I was in medical school, somebody told me that type two diabetes is a reversible disease that somebody told me that plaqued up arteries, you can reverse that. Um, the high blood pressure, you can reverse that. The, I learned the opposite. Once you once on insulin, always on insulin. You'll take these blood pressure pills the rest of your life. And I believe that. And I parroted those words for decades till the evidence is clear. These are reversible diseases. It was caused by an unhealthy diet. Get them on a healthy diet. And these diseases go away. Yeah, well, this is life-saving information for one, the doctor to know. I wish I had known that early in my career. And it's important information to impart to the patient. You know, you can reverse this disease. You want to get rid of your diabetes. You want to get rid of your high blood pressure. You want to get rid of your lupus. Uh, you want to get rid of your colitis. You can, these reversible disease. So that's the most hopeful, positive, powerful message that, uh, that I've gleaned from uh, the studies in recent years. Um, type 2 diabetes, again, uh, high carbohydrate diets in a whole form are as curative for diabetes, on, uh, contrary to what most people think who avoid those sugars. Um, and, um, and the importance of fiber in the diet, how many of these diseases from colitis to RA, everything uh, has to do with our, again, going back to our diet, but uh, you get these folks on, you know, lots of salads and veggies and get, a, you know, 30, 40 grams of fiber. It's amazing how well the body runs and how the weight comes off naturally. So uh, the reversibility of diseases and uh, high carbohydrate, low fat, high fiber diets uh, to reverse uh, as a reversing agent, I think is a hopeful, positive and powerful message that the literature has given us. Um, two things. Um, first, the Ornish study, as it relates to prostate cancer, um, the intervention was not only diet, right? The intervention was a plant-based diet, plus community, plus stress management, plus exercise, plus certain supplements, vitamin C, D, some omega-3s, I think. So it wasn't just diet. So 
I love that study because it shows that everything is important, not just diet. And yes, it showed some decent results. Though I know other researchers in that study from the UCSF, and they said to me, look, I don't know what's happening while well, the study was going on, but some of these people look really sick. I don't know what he meant by that. I'm just saying what another doctor told me that was involved in that study. I still think, but in terms of the, what the research shows is, uh, yeah, there was, uh, there was a regression of prostate cancer in the group that it was a randomized trial, very difficult to do. I've tried and I said, look, this is too, I'm not, a, that's not what I'm, I'm not going to get into research. It was just too difficult. Ornish did it. Uh, and um, I'm grateful for that. And so what the study showed was lifestyle practices, not only diet, can help in regressing prostate cancer. And that's exactly what I prescribe is a lifestyle approach, not just diet. The biggest study, I think that the biggest ground to me groundbreaking was in 2018, the uh, journal uh, JAMA that from France showing that um, those that, that consume organic foods have a lower risk of cancer versus those that consume conventional foods with pesticides. We all know, I always knew that pesticides are a problem, were a problem for a variety of reasons, certainly as it relates to cancer, but this was a big study from and published in a major journal, kind of putting the nail on a coffin that these pesticides are a problem. So I think that eating organic food is worth the extra money, but I think more importantly is eating local food where it is organic, but they can't label it. Um, it's even probably more important uh, because they don't, whatever reason, there, there's reasons for that, but that's the bottom line. Um, and, but eating foods that are very low to no pesticide, low in pesticides, because they all have some, it's, it's a, is a, is a, is a big deal. And that's it. You know, I, I just like to comment. I, I know Dr. Ernst quite well. Mm -hmm. And I think he would say the diet was the major factor. And he stopped using uh, uh, omega-3 fats with his prostate cancer patients. That's one of the things he changed in his protocol because, you know, he realized that uh, that these uh, omega-3 fats, flaxseed oil, et cetera, promotes cancer, promotes prostate cancer. So, you know, it was the diet. You know, looking back at his work and the work of others, it was the diet that made the difference. Uh, I know you don't agree. No, because that's not what the study says. I, I would agree that. And I've met with Dean Ornish and that's not what he told me. I'm not saying that what he told you is different from what you said, but that's not what he expressed to me. So the study says what the study says, not what either Dean Ornish or any researcher or anyone thinks. It says what it says. And it, there was multiple interventions going on at the same time. And as it relates to um, oils and, and, and things like that, I do think that flaxseed oil is a problem. And I think that oils that are rancid, which flaxseed oils tend to be, are problematic. Flaxseeds, I think, are very good for prostate cancer, as an aside. Um, but flaxseed oils are, are a problem, just to kind of include that in there. But the study says what the study says, and the intervention is the intervention, not what anyone thinks. Um, and Mul cancer, including prostate cancer, is multifactorial. So why? Ca how can one thing, including a prostatectomy or radiation, thirty to fifty percent of the people who get a prostatectomy or radiation for their prostate cancer have a recurrence within five to ten years? So one modality is never the answer, ever, including lifestyle, medicine, and natural approaches. It's it's all the elements that work together seemingly and that have the best uh, uh, benefit for, for the patient, so. Yeah, Steve. Okay, uh, Brenda, would you like to ask a question or where are you from? Hi, it's Brenda from DC. I'm curious, um, just a couple of things. One is um, there are several cultures outside of Western uh, U.S. culture, where people use olive oil as part of their of their diet, um, and in many of the blue zones, I don't know the research around that particularly, where yeah. longest living people actually use some level of oil in their, uh, or beans. You know, people in in South America. So I'm a little, I'm curious about this, this either or dichotomy that seems to be arising. 
in the call around yeah. there being no way to do something. But I found that a lot of non-Western cultures, there is a holistic approach of eating what grows where you live and community being a part of health and healing and oil being a part of it as well. I am curious about that, but also I am curious. I've done Dr. McDougall's um, um, diet and, um, and have seen that something does change in the body quite rapidly, um, but that, you know, so I'm, I'm curious that it doesn't have to be this either or dichotomous adversarial approach because we see across the globe there are lots of people doing lots of things and living very good lives. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to tell you why I think it's the food. You know, again, it has to do with looking at cultures from the past. You know, I have to, I have to believe, in fact, I do know for sure that people living in Japan or China, they had marital disputes, they had problems paying their bills, they had wars, they had all kinds of stresses in their life, yet with high levels of stress, they still avoided 100% having prostate cancer, heart disease, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. You know, the only thing that I can see is a big difference in uh, then and now is the fact that they now eat a rich Western diet. Prostate cancer is on the rise in Asia. You know, I, 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 again, I just have to emphasize that you can look at it from my point of view, or you can look at it from, the, from a multi-factor point of view, or you don't really know where to put your fingers on it. It's the food, folks. And once you get a hold of the food, so many things get straightened out. I don't even know that you can change your attitude or your personality. I've been like this my whole life. And as far as exercise goes, uh, you know, we're talking about times when people didn't do anything but walk. Maybe you rode a few horses. Hold on one second. Transportation. Oh, hold on one second. Dr. Espinosa, could you lower your speaker? It might be picking up another speaker. Can you lower the volume of that? Oh, sure, I'll try. Okay, go ahead, Dr. McDougal. Well, I just, I just want you to know, I find the idea that uh, when you give people a whole bunch of outs, oh, it's probably not your diet. It's probably that you're stressed or maybe you're not taking enough supplements or you know, maybe you got bad genes. They're paralyzed by this kind of information that allows them to for the problem. Whereas you should tell them just, you know, the simple truth. It's the food. You're suffering from food poisoning. And once you straighten that out, so many things get fixed. Not just, not just the, the heart disease, not just reducing the growth of cancer, and not just uh, stopping the attacks of arthritis. The constipation goes away too, and your food bill improves, and you lose all that extra body fat which is so common for people to carry that extra fat. Oh, by the way, I was going to ask you, Dr. Espinoza, have you published any of your research, number one? And number two, do you sell the nutraceuticals that you use in your protocol? Of course, yes, I do. Of course, the, my, the, the nutraceuticals are an extension of my research and experience. And no one is, and so since it doesn't exist out there, I, I just don't understand what the problem is. I'm sure you have courses and I, I don't understand what the problem is. I disclose it with all my patients. I disclose it with everyone. And it's an extension of my experience, research and, and everything I've done. So I don't understand why that keeps coming up as a problem. Have you published your research? Excuse me? Have you published your research? I published some research. And where do we okay. find you go, you put PubMed, put S G O Giovanni Espinoza, and you'll see what I've published. I'll, I'll I sp that. yeah, I spend, but I tell you, I tell you more importantly, I've looked at other people's research. So here's what I decided to do long ago. I used to be at Columbia University Department of Urology, running research on nutraceuticals and things like that. I didn't enjoy it. Doing research for those that love it, Dean Ordinance, that's why I give them the credit in the world to put that randomized trial. I didn't enjoy it. It was horrible. The select trial with vitamin E and selenium that many people know about with prostate cancer, I had to cut toenails to then send it to the lab so they could read their selenium levels from the tone. I didn't enjoy it at all. So that's that. Um, and, then I, and then I saw that I'm not going to do that anymore. And then I saw that, wow, other people are doing even better research than I can do. So I started focusing on gathering that research and on the implementation of that research, 
which I think is even more important than just doing research, right? Spending all this time writing papers. And, and then, you know, I, can, I only have but so much time in a day. Um, I wanted to implement that. And as a result, um, I've been very successful doing that. So. Okay. Uh, Joel, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? I am from Ashland, Massachusetts. I thank you very much. It's great to uh, see this august panel you have assembled here. And I have a question about two nutrients. Uh, the first is olive oil. Uh, Dr. Joel Kahn was on this uh, conference earlier and was talking about something called the Cordioprev study. And some of the indications were that uh, olive oil and perhaps some other oils actually reduce inflammation and that this was relatively new information that he was citing as very contrary to what we've been told for quite a while. Uh, I also saw Dr. Kim Williams somewhat agree, not with that specific study, but saying that there are so, there is some new research that uh, oils, uh, certain oils can reduce inflammation and that they should be added to the diet, at least in moderation. Uh, so that's one. And then the other nutrient I was curious about, I hate to bring this up again, but should we or should we not, I guess you can go for yes or no, add uh, flax seed and chia seed to our oatmeal in the morning. Yes. Uh, I assume I'm going to start. Uh, flax seed and chia seed, they're whole seeds. I don't think it'll do any harm. It's when you start to grind and you separate the oil from the, the rest of the seed that you run into problems. So, you know, I, I, I can tell you, I just take a basic stand that all free oils are toxic, whether they be olive oil, flax seed oil, et cetera, they're toxic. They don't exist in nature. You have to process uh, some type of plant part. In other words, to get these oils, at the very least, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And if you eat olive oil fat, you're gonna wear it. And I don't think there's anything more attractive about wearing a big belly of olive fat as opposed to a big belly of beef fat. Um, when I hear the studies that uh, Dr. Warner and Dr. Kahn are citing, um, again, this is, these are probably done on people eating the standard American diet and they're eating cheeseburgers and buffalo wings and they're walking around with high levels of inflammation. And if they eat, consume a lot of olive oil, yeah, there's probably some anti-inflammatory components there and it probably lowers their HSCRP a little bit. And they say, ah, da -da, olive oil is good for you. It lowers inflammation. But if someone's eating a whole food plant-based diet, if the only thing going down your gullet is a steady stream of dark leafy greens and rice and beans and fruits and vegetables, your inflammatory state could fit into a flea's navel. It should be so low that you don't need olive oil. You don't have to uh, uh, be uh, com you know, compulsive about uh, you know, this supplement and that supplement. Uh, and so, so again, you got to look at the patient and the food stream, not just Joe America as the uh, as the sample population here. It's not it doesn't really apply to folks who've made the plant based uh, evolution in their diet. And so I got you know, a real world uh, statement here. Uh, I was railing against oils and one day uh, 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 someone in the audience came up to me and says, Doc, I'm an Asian chef and I make up a nice uh, Asian curry and I put in two drops of sesame oil. Are you really telling me that those two drops of sesame oil are really going to raise the risk of heart disease or cancer in my patients? And I don't know, it's, it's not going to do that. And it, it's, you know, as the toxicologists say, the dose makes the poison. And the, you know, this tiny amount here, you know, let's you know, be honest, that has to be pretty benign. And a teaspoon, literally a teaspoon of olive oil and, uh, sprayed on some veggie, probably not going to do a whole uh, lot of damage. But again, the dose makes the poison. If you have people, you know, we're Americans, if a little is good, more must be better. And so out comes the cruet of olive oil and corn. And, ooh, Mediterranean diet. Ooh, Dr. Williams says it's heart healthy. Dr. Khan says it's heart healthy. And they're pouring the oil on and it's dripping off the veggies. Those folks, I think, 
um, are going to run into some problems from cancer and blood clotting and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we got to be realistic about this, but generally oils are an unnatural food uh, that cause mischief in the body used in tiny amounts as a flavoring, I guess is fairly benign, but man, don't, don't push it, but they are not health promoting foods and uh, be aware of which study you're citing. If it's done on standard American folks eating a standard American diet, how much is that really relevant to the conversation we're having now? Shanti, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Hi, I'm from Quakertown, Pennsylvania. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for this conference and to Dr. Clapper and Dr. McDougall. I have been a whole food plant-based vegan since I was in the womb and I'm 45 years old. Everybody thinks I am half my age and I'm healthier than ever. I've never been to a doctor or needed one. And I am proof that you can really just live a very simple life and eat very simply as our ancestors did. Only we're in a new world and we really need to consider all life on this planet the health of everyone and everything and the planet itself. So I just mainly wanted to say thank you and I'll volunteer for any kind of study on people who've only spent their lives living this simply, which I think is an evolution where as Dr. McDougall said, we don't need, we shouldn't need doctors ultimately when everybody is in good health. So thank you so much for all the wonderful work you guys have done over a lifetime. I've, I'm eternally grateful. You're welcome. <laughs> Benny, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Uh, from California. So 5,000 years of human history and we still can't agree what to eat even on this great panel. <laughs> Talking about an optimal diet, I personally think life begets life and dead and processed foods beget disease and deaths. So fresh fruits and veggies are best for Genesis 129. If not fully raw, what percent raw is best for health? Well, I, the diet I recommend is of cooked food. No, uh, you can't eat raw brown rice, you can't eat raw, well, maybe you can, but it's hard to eat raw corn and raw potatoes. So it's a cooked food diet. How, what percent needs to be raw to make it better than a cooked food starch-based diet? None. You know, cooking, cooking is the reason that we're human primates. And we require that uh, evolution to, to harness fire. That's why we have the brain that we have that's three times the size of a chimpanzee. It's because we were able to switch from raw food to cooked food. We were able to switch from fruits and non-perishable vegetables, green and yellow vegetables to starch. That was the, the evolution that really changed us from lesser primates to human beings. So cooking's the natural diet of people. So I'm going to differ with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. McDougall. Um, I think there is something to raw foods um, that is lost. Where even I didn't used to believe this. I think you know, two minutes in a vegetable steamer. Are you really going to change the kale uh, composition? Um, I find my folks with inflammatory diseases do better on salads and fruits. When they add in a lot of cooked vegetables, their their inflammation gets worse. I think there's something to um, to having a significant component of your diet uncooked, uh, at least one big salad every day. I think it's really important. And a couple pieces of fruit, which would be raw. Uh, are, I think there is something, I, I, I can't get down to the granular science, what it exactly is in the raw vegetables, but I think uh, having a significant amount of raw vegetables uh, is, is beneficial. The third, 20, 30, 40% depends if you're doing it by calories or by weight or whatever, but at least have a big honker salad every day with lots of colorful vegetables in there. Uh, I think uh, you're better off than eating everything cooked. Well, uh, you know, it's not that we exclude raw food from our program. We don't, you know that, Michael. Right. It's just, you know, the idea that raw food is going to be some type of ma magical change to solve the problems. You know, I haven't seen it and I'm glad you have. 
Megan, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Hi, uh, yes, I would. I am from St. Louis, Missouri, and I have been whole food plant-based for five, six years, um, actually since I saw uh, McDougal in Food Choices, which was such a great documentary. I never looked back. Uh, and ever since I have been educating myself to the best of my abilities, uh, and recently uh, within this conference actually decided I am gonna go back to school and I was looking at registered dietetics. And I wanted to know, um, just because I want to be able to reach out and help people the way that you guys uh, helped me and so many of us listening and so many others, is registered dietetics, uh, you think, the best route to go about getting to people and um, you know being able to be a service to the whole plant-based movement? I think you need to get some type of ticket, whether it be a, uh, a DO, an MD, an RD, or you know, natural, whatever. I think you need to have some type of certification. And uh, at least that gives you credibility so you can talk to people who you, you feel important to talk to, like your colleagues and your clientele. Now, once you get this ticket, you know, this certification that you have been at least educated and certified to know something, then you go out and practice what you know to be true. Nobody's going to be able to take that certificate away from you. And you will be able to, you know, practice what you've learned. And hopefully you'll teach people a whole food plant-based diet based on starch. Let's hope so. A little exercise, a little sunshine. They'll do great. I absolutely, I, I do plan on um, uh, passing that message, your message along. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, Steve. Um, I need to attend to my family. Uh, they're still waiting for me and it's Friday night. So can I sign off? Yes, thank you so much. My pleasure. Dr. Espinosa, we greatly appreciate Take you care. coming and offering your thoughts. Thank you so we'll, much. We'll, we'll miss you, Dr. Espinosa. Thank pleasure. you, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Well done. You, Ron, would you like to ask a question or where are you from? Hi, uh, thank you for getting, getting me asking. Uh, I'm from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm plant-based diet, uh, BMI 21, my blood test results are within, within the range, except of the omega-3 index, which is, uh, came up as 1%, although I <laughs> eat on a daily basis, uh, ground flax seed and walnuts and many nuts and seeds. I uh, would like to uh, understand from you how, what you recommend to uh, such, such a case that, you know, yeah, the omega level is, is low. We understand how it's important it is. Uh, and although I'm, I'm taking, you know, nuts and seeds and ground, ground flex seeds. Thank you. Uh, can you repeat the question, Steve? Did you understand the gist of it? Yeah. So can, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead again. So, so again, I'm, I'm plant-based diet that, uh, that uh, all, all, all my factors are within the range except of the omega-3 index that is 1%, although it's need to be above five. So my question is, although I'm, I'm eating on a daily basis ground flax seeds uh, and walnuts and some other omega-3 seeds, my question for you, how would you recommend to such a uh, patient or person to increase his omega-3 levels? I, I would stop getting the test. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're being sent off in a nonsense direction. Plants make omega-3s. No animal does. No fish does. Just eat the plants. You cannot possibly miss. <clears throat> You'll get all of your alpha linoleic acid, all of your EPA, all of your DHA and the other stuff that they try and sell you in supplement bottles. It's nonsense, get it from the plants. Yeah, there's serious question about this blood test, the omega check, uh, how much omega-3s are in the red cell envelopes there. Um, well, th that's uh, not really a, a valid measurement of the most important reactions, and that's what's happening in your brain tissue. And um, lots of DHA and EPA, et cetera, gets made in the brain tissue itself. The, the, most of the 
And ALA, the linoleic acid that's in the flax seeds and the walnuts, goes right into the cells. Now, the vast ninety percent of it, not out in the bloodstream, it's in your cells, and it's the cells who decide how much of that ALA to turn into EPA and DHA. And the blood test doesn't reflect that. And I'm getting really dis uh, disenchanted with the, these all omega six. You're chasing a number that doesn't really tell you what's happening in your brain tissue, which is the real specter of this dementia that's hanging over here. Um, and so, uh, like Dr. McDougall says. Uh, I would stop getting the test. I, uh, uh, no matter how much walnuts and flax you eat, your, that, um, your blood test is not going to change. And it doesn't really reflect what's really going on in your brain tissue there. It's not an accurate test. Uh, I would stop getting it. I've stopped getting it as well. Don't you see what's going on? You're, you're, you're having tests done that end up in creating a tremendous amount of business. You know, it creates business for the doctors, for the laboratories, for the supplement salespeople, for the supplement manufacturers. This is business, ladies and gentlemen. You know, you're, you're being sold based upon a whole bunch of manufacturers just make, want to make a ton of money. They don't really care what, about your health. Lori, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Hey, I'm... Um from Birmingham, Alabama. And I just want to say thank you so much. Dr. Clapper and Dr. McDougall are my heroes. I've, Dr. Clapper, I've heard many times on the Holistic Holiday at Seas uh, lectures. And uh -huh. Dr. McDougall, I don't know if you remember, but my husband and son and I attended your program in December of 2016. And uh -huh. I just wanted to share that my we went there because my son um, as a young child was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And then at age 23 was diagnosed with um, MS. And so we started researching for, you know, alternative to the toxic medicines that they push you for MS. And Dr. McDougall, um, you mentioned Dr. Swank and we found him. And so we went to the program and I just want to share that my son is doing absolutely wonderful. We've been following, um, a whole food plant-based diet since 2016. And he is um, on no medications for MS whatsoever. He runs regularly um, um, marathons, half marathons, 10 Ks, um, he's just in great shape. And uh, we're just so, so thankful for you guys. I just, I just can't express enough. Um, I did have one question though, and that is something you said just recently, Dr. McDougall, about the flax seeds and not uh, grinding them. If you put them in a green smoothie or something, um, I, and some people say grind them in a coffee grinder before to get the extra benefit. I, I, I'm <coughs> confused about that. What happens, you've got the whole seed, which has a, a very strong non-digestible coat around it. So the flax seed goes to the intestinal tract pretty much undigested. Once you break it up with a you know, blender or grinder, and what you do is you change the physical composition of the food. And in particular, you re release the fats. And so now you're dealing with something where the internal contents of this flaxseed becomes exposed, i.e., in other words, you're eating a lot of fat. And of course, when you strip the, the fiber and all the other material away, and you're left with free oil, then you're leave, left with something, uh, something that's even more distant from the natural flaxseed. So, you know, flax seeds are probably okay for you because they're not digested, you know, and they also cause a, a better bowel movement. So that's why people sometimes take them. But I don't think you need them for good health. Okay. Thank you. Again, thank you so much. We love you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. McDougall and Dr. Clapper, why don't you make your closing statement to summarize your final thoughts before we sign off for the evening? Are you waiting for me, Michael? Yes, sir. After you, sir. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure to talk to the group here. And uh, it, it troubles me greatly to see people uh, be led in directions that are profitable for business and don't result in good outcomes. And you're, you're going to hear a lot of people at this conference and other conferences. And I, I think what you owe yourself is to test what they have to say. You know, listen to what they have to say and make sure it's not going to kill you if you follow the program or the protocol. Then think of what it would cost you in time, money, and effort to put it to a test. And then I will tell you, folks, the body heals in about four months. If you're not better from whatever 
treatment is recommended within four months, you're wasting your time and your money. And I would certainly put what Dr. Clapper and I recommend to the test to any of you. Do what we suggest for a week, 12 days. Certainly by four months, I'll admit that, you know, we can't help you. Doesn't cost you anything. It's kind for the planet. Solves all kinds of health problems, all the way from obesity to constipation. Why would you pass up something so good? Here, here. Uh, hard for me to uh, put a PS on that. Um, we're plant eating hominids. We have basically the same digestive system that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have. They're up in the trees eating leaves and fruits and they don't develop diabetes. They don't develop high blood pressure. They don't develop clogged arteries. Um, a, a whole food plant-based diet will leave you lean and healthy and clean on the inside. And, and we just can no longer ignore the cost that an animal-based diet inflicts upon planet Earth. What right do we have to slaughter 80 billion living creatures every year, a trillion sea creatures every year, uh, to inflict death on such an industrial scale on these innocent animals? We're, we're, we're killing, you know, like Dr. Rao says, the, the, the killing machine and the burning machine are destroying us. We're burning the forests and we're killing the animals. That needs to stop. And it starts with what we order for lunch. When you are pushing that cart down the supermarket aisle and deciding what to put in the basket, and when you're sitting at restaurant with that menu in front of you, uh, that's the time to, to listen to your better angels there. Every time you say, I'll have the beef, I'll have the chicken, your children's world gets a little drier, a little deader. Um, it's time for us to affirm life on every level. And that starts with what we're having for dinner and having for lunch. And a whole food plant-based diet is a life affirming diet on every level. It's time to really uh, accept that and, and act on it. And if we do that, the earth will heal, will heal. And, uh, uh, and uh, we can talk about lighter, happier things at the next conference. Thank you, Steve, for the invitation, for, for putting on this remarkable conference and for trying to get light out to uh, all these thousands and thousands of people who are participating. Uh, the communicators are just as valuable as the doctors and the researchers, et cetera. So thank you for being such a good communicator. It's a great service that you're doing. Thank you. I think I, the, the, the first interest I ever had in health or in plant-based eating was many years ago, I picked up um, Dr. McDougall's, one of his first books and read it. And that was the impetus for me getting involved in health and led to all this. So I want to thank both of you. I think the audience, what they really want me to say to you is that we appreciate that you spent a hundred years between the two of you living this, researching this, devoting your lives. We, we feel your intention. We understand that you're on our side and whether or not every single thing you've ever said is perfect or not, we truly believe we live in a world where a lot of people aren't on our side. And I speak for everyone on this call when I said, we really do think you're on our side and we appreciate it. And I want to unmute everyone so everyone could say thank you also to you. Thank 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 you.